Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, anyone who's watching on my stream as well, let us know how volume and everything is, if, if that's good. Um, I am Madam Genevieve, um, Jen for short. <laughs> I am, I guess the best way to describe myself is I am a sex positive feminist. I am a sex worker. Um, and recently in the past, less than the past year, um, I have been a streamer. I got into streaming in springtime ish around the time that the Roe v. Wade mm. Supreme Court decision leak happened. Whoa, you, you um, really new girl. You're like new. super new. Like, what are we like six, nine months? Yeah, wow. Okay. Somewhere in there. Um, and I have to be like, I'm so grateful to the political community, both on Twitch and on YouTube, because they welcome me with open arms and I got to talk to a lot of really cool people. Um I did hippy dippy. Yeah. I did um, panels with Wick, Death of Certainty. Um, I was on a panel um, that was hosted by Mr. Girl, um, where I actually met Destiny, and then mm. he and I talked one on one. Um, I interacted with Not So Erudite, um, Chud Logic, like all of these really yeah. cool people. But, previously seen and they actually were like tell us your opinion on these things and it was really really awesome um I'm obviously based on that introduction very upset about the overturning of Roe v Wade so um I was passionately engaging in those debates yeah um and then sometime around summer <laughs> um a another streamer popped up uh who identified herself as an ex-sex worker oh. who was on this, <laughs> this <Who>? campaign, <laughs> this campaign to really critique sex work and, mm. and to kind of lump all sex workers into this victim kind of role. role. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up doing a Chud Logic panel and another Destiny conversation with with her and a few other people. Um and man, did I rub her the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> I um, obviously, again, have had really, I'm fortunate, I've had mostly very positive experiences with sex work. I come to it from like a very purposeful place. Um, and I think that in my experience, it's been really positive. So we obviously clashed on that a lot. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> made for some really entertaining content again. <laughs> it did. Um, it did. It, yeah. Um, so, so yes, here I am now. I, I yeah. stepped away from doing the political debates this fall just because I was, like, getting invited on a lot of panels where I was like, I'm not an expert on, like, mm. constitutional <laughs> law, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, like, I like I, how I feel about this thing and this is what I want. This is, this is the problem I run into. Would you say that your work then is centered more smaller community, more niche focus, more individual focus? Yes, 100% yes, which I think is also true about you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have said that you and I have similar approaches to things. So really? that's kind of why I'm curious. I've been wanting to talk to you because I'm like, oh, I can see how she and I have some things in common. Okay, great. So, well, I'm excited. Sorry, tell me your age again. If you said it, I did not process it. I am 35. 35. Okay, perfect. So we're like the same age. I'm going to be 34 in May. Um, okay. and in January. So I'll actually be 36. Ooh, Next. okay, perfect. So we have a couple of years. And then are you in the States? Yes, I live in um, Las Vegas. I'm Ooh, fun. I about that. I'm, I'm born and raised in San Francisco, Bay Area girl. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in Southern California right. for a few years as well. Um, and I've been in Vegas since just before the pandemic. Why Vegas? So um, in like 2018-ish, I was living in LA with my now fiance. And we knew that we didn't want to live in Southern California anymore. Sorry, my camera's blurred because I'm moving. It should That's adjust okay. itself. Uh, <laughs> I get really animated. <laughs> I like it. We knew we knew we didn't want to stay in LA anymore. It wasn't like creating a healthy environment for us. Um, it was just stressful. I, I, I like visiting Southern California, but I don't like living there. For sure. um, and at that point in time, the Bay Area is just like infamously expensive and I knew that I didn't want to commit to working in the corporate world anymore mm -hmm. um I recently turned 30 and I had this like awakening that I wanted to live my life 
as authentically as possible and do things that made me happy. And it wasn't worth making this impressive salary and having this impressive title if I wasn't getting to do things that actually brought me joy. Totally. So I retired from that life and started pursuing things that felt more authentic and more fun and genuine. Um, so moving back to the Bay Area meant that I would have to have a real job because it's just ridiculous to, to live there. It's, yeah. it's so expensive. There's no way to do it without without that, that I, that I knew of at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, and not wanting to have that commitment, we were looking at other metropolitan areas, mostly on the West Coast, uh, and we landed on Las Vegas. It's, mm. it's always been that I've had a lot of fun in. We have good memories here. Um, everybody knows the Strip, of course, but, like, there's so much more to the city and to the yeah. area. It's been really cool. We live um, off the Strip. Um, and, uh, there's just like these beautiful mountains and canyons and that's great. The desert is just gorgeous. I love the desert. I'm a big desert girl. So like I'm 100% on top of that. People have always told me to move to maybe Nevada, but I've driven through a few times. It's not exactly my vibe, but I'm curious about if there's any overlap, not only environmentally. So you move there, let's say for mountains, but did you actually move there at all related to sex work? A little bit, yeah. So there were quite a few things that we looked at. We looked at, obviously, we wanted a metropolitan area. That was important to us. I want to have all of those conveniences. I'm ultimately a city girl. So we wanted to be within, like, ideally, like, 30 minutes of a major metropolitan area. Um, I knew that I wanted a city that was going to be kind of eclectic and diverse. Mm. I love that about San Francisco, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that Las Vegas has a very strong sex work community. A lot of my internet friends at that point were already based out of Las Vegas and we were already interacting. So it was cool to know people before I got here. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, yeah, that was definitely a factor as well. Okay. And curious, what kind of sex work do you do? So I do a mix. I dabble here and there. (laughs) I have the OnlyFans, uh, as you know, a lot of us do. Yes. Um, I've been doing that actually since 2015. (laughs) I was I was pretty early to jump on that. Um, And mine is mine is maybe different than a lot of people think of OnlyFans now. Like I like to think of it also as like a really genuine and like raw representation of me and my sexuality. So. you know, sometimes <laughs> I I have to say one of the first times I saw you talk about your OnlyFans, you're like, sometimes I'm na- naked, sometimes I'm not, sometimes I'm masturbating. And I'm like, oh, my God, yes, same. Yeah. Sometimes I'm cooking in my underwear. Sometimes I'm masturbating. Sometimes I'm taking a bubble bath. Like, yes. Oh, I love that. You're getting, like, glimpses of my real life that includes yeah. sexuality. Yeah. Um, I'm endlessly curious about people's unique sexual kinks and desires. Like that's one thing that has driven me for years. I want to know all about like what gets other people off. So I really do enjoy taking custom requests. I don't obviously say yes to all of them, but Mm -hmm. like getting to have somebody share a fantasy with me and help them make it come to life is so cool. So I really enjoy doing that. Um, I also do some in real life sex work, very, Selectively, I'm privileged that I do get to have that um, filter, of course. Um, I like to introduce people to kink, BDSM, where possible. Um, I love to come at um, in real life interactions from like a sex education standpoint. So if somebody is like having a hard time orgasming or Mm -hmm. having like some particular Mm -hmm. challenge, like I can teach them about their body and how to gain pleasure from it. Like that's Mm. fantastic. I absolutely love that. Um, I love working with couples. I think that's also really, really like to be invited into someone else's intimacy. Yes. What? No. Oh my gosh. 100. Wait, that. Okay. Can I say something? I'm going to interrupt. Yes, please. Jump in. (laughs) I always wanted to be a fairy fuck mother. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like I just love since I was young I liked the not too young when I was like an adult but I liked the idea yeah of someone coming to me and saying hey I never thought about it but I kind of think I want to use handcuffs I'm like oh wait hold on I know how to do this safely and reasonably and I know exactly like, I can do this with you but I've noticed that when I try to interact with people in more of a let me teach you way it only worked in dungeons and it only worked um, when people clearly were there for um, also like meditative spiritual goals. Yeah. So how yeah, do you like? It's... How do you have like a comfortable level with like? I mean, obviously, if you're doing full service sex work, maybe it's a different conversation. Um, but like, how do you create a good boundary with your clients in that regard? 
I really always think it starts with like having a conversation in a non-sexual environment where we can like ideally get all the cards on the table as yes. much as possible, right? Yes. Like what what is your expectation out of this? How can I accommodate what you're looking for if I can, you know, sometimes? And again, I, I, I am able to be very selective. So I do have the ability to say, you know what? We're talking about this. I don't think it's the right fit. Yeah. Um, maybe I can refer you to somebody else or so on and so forth. Um, but really just asking a ton of questions, kind of coming up with with a little bit of a roadmap and and managing expectations. And I will say that's such a corporate phrase, managing expectations. That's <laughs> one thing <laughs> that I've carried over from my previous career yeah. that has been so helpful. Like obviously the marketing, the sales, like all of those things are helpful of as course. well. But like the soft skills of helping to manage how a conversation and an interaction can go is really helpful here because I am essentially providing a form of customer service mm -hmm. and I want to do that in the most transparent way possible. Yes. Okay. I had the, the greatest like privilege of having like a mentor in BDSM, somebody who could bring me in and make me read all the books and be responsible and showed me all the ways to consider my consent, to consider my boundaries. And I remember she told me no is a complete sentence. And that was the first time in my adult life anyone had ever said that to me. You know, my mom had said things like, hey, you put up a fight, you say no and you walk away. But no one had ever said in well, she in the dungeon, she explained that when I said no, if anyone followed up with a why not, the you should probably tell a dungeon monitor because there's no reason for anyone, no adult, like if they said, hey, Brittany, why aren't you naked? Which they did the first party I went to. I said, oh, you know, I'm just not ready to get nude. Most people went, oh, okay, cool. And like they were just curious and then they yeah. went away. But in other settings, you know, they'd be like, well, why not? What's your issue? You need to get over that. Right. Why aren't you working on that? And I'm just like, that's a lot of over – like, I'm already in a dungeon with a bunch of naked people. I had never – I was 21. I was a virgin. I had never seen a penis in real life. And here I was oh. surrounded by all these naked humans. And I was like – I love it. You just jumped right in. That's I so did. Fantastic. I did. I Well, I tend to do that. I'm not a spontaneous human, but I am a – if we're going to do it, let's just fucking do it. So I can make mm -hmm. sure that I'm getting a real experience. With that said, though, I do consider my consent. I consider the environment I'm in. I am sober when I'm in these situations. I'm trying to be thoughtful. So it's not like I'm jumping in carelessness, neat, careless, carelessness. Oh, my God. It's very thoughtful. Yeah. I try, <laughs> thanks, girl. I try to be as much as possible. So I think like when I think about sex work, I'm always thinking about boundaries. Same with my callers. If I get a caller and I'm like, you know mm -hmm. what? This isn't really a vibe or, oh, like I, I may be misunderstanding what's happening here. Like I'm trying to figure people out and give people grace to be their yeah. unique selves. Um, now, I'm curious, though, a lot of my perception of sexuality actually comes from my love of erotica and erotic things. So it's not just like sex. It's also the eroticism of it. So I don't know if you've ever been to the Seattle Erotic Arts Festival, but it's like one of my favorite events. So one of my one of my I don't know if regrets is the right word yet, but um, one one thing that I wish were not true is that I've never been to Seattle. I. Oh. Like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life because I live on the West Coast. You're, right there. Like, You're so close. so close. But I've never been to Seattle. I oh, need my to. gosh. Okay, we need to do like a whole event or something. Are, are you going to keep yes. this this year? I don't know if you want to tell people, but like, are you going? I mean, yes, I would love to. I don't have like solid plans in place yet. Okay, but I'm like starting to map out my 2023 calendar and like mm -hmm, plot some things. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, because I'm like this close to going to King Fest in April in Portland. For you, for those of you who don't know, it was basically shut down during COVID or they did online kink fest yeah like yeah not the same kink fest is so fun <laughs> oh, i'm so excited to be doing events again yeah like, same avn is happening here in vegas Ooh, in january so which like had been not really the same for the past couple years you know um Ugh, it's gonna be good. I it's knew so be, many it's people. Gonna be a fun time. Like I had invites to go years and years ago, and I couldn't go. And then I had so many girlfriends of mine who were there or who were nominated or whatever. And it's like so interesting because like what a different world. I'm gonna call it a bubble, but like what an interesting bubble. It's like so people yes. don't know there's like an awards, there's like credits. People get people go into sex work. Not okay. So there's this like conspiracy. I call it a conspiracy online where people think sex work is only survival sex work, and right that is a huge part of it. Yes, it oh. is. And those people should be cared for and we should be considering our communities in that regard. But 
let's take them out of the conversation for just a moment because they are truly their own focus. And there is a part of sex work that has awards, communities, friends, like you want film credits. There's a part of sex work that is open and honest, mm, honest caveat businesses are being <laughs> run here. But like, you know, there people are trying to build a real business here, like a real image, yes. right? And so like people don't understand what you think of as shameful, like, oh, I don't want anyone to know I'm doing sex work. There are other people on the other side of the bubble that's literally like, please recognize me for my sex work. Like they're putting in tremendous work. They're collaborating. They're coming up with theme. You know, it's just it is this huge creative process. And yeah. it's it's cool that there's a venue where they can be celebrated and get to show off what they've accomplished. And for sure, it's really cool. And I've. I don't do, I've never done like production porn in that capacity, but I do have a lot of friends who do and, and have, and have been nominated. And it's a really, really cool thing to, to witness and experience yeah. if you get the opportunity. Now, well, here's what's funny. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I am the kind of personality that I probably never do porn on camera uh, with a person. I probably, I say probably asterisks because you never know, girl. Yeah, you but, never, you never know. <laughs> but probably, and a big part of it is that I already feel really vulnerable when I'm doing stuff that I would like to keep certain things, like, because I'm pretty vulnerable during sex. It's the one time my brain, like, shuts off. And yeah. so I don't really want to share that with the world, but I do appreciate that people can be performative in their sex enough to share it with the world, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah. I feel like... I also, so like most of the sexual content that I produce most is just solo. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not super common that I film with someone else. If I do, it's more likely going to be um, somebody who is not male identifying. Mm -hmm. um, although I have done a little bit with my current partner and that's something that we are actually possibly going to be pursuing a little bit more in the new year. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, while I haven't fully embraced that yet, I'm I'm looking into ways to bring that into what I'm creating because I would like to share a little bit more yeah. of that. Um, I'm an exhibitionist, so it's mm. fun for me to share my sexuality in that way. Um, but I don't know that I would ever shoot with like a production company because I'm yeah. a control freak and I need to know that I have full control over like what, yes. what the visuals are, what's happening, what the editing looks like, like all of that. I, I need to be the one. That's why I like OnlyFans. Like everyone was yes. like, okay, I was on Tumblr naked for free for funsies, right? I was like on all these websites mm -hmm. and Life and all this stuff. And then three years ago when the pandemic was happening, people were like, Brittany, get on OnlyFans. I was like, well, I don't want you guys to feel like if I have an OnlyFans, I have to do certain things. And they're like, no, no, you could just do whatever you want. I was like, wait, really? So then I joined yes. OnlyFans and I was like, oh shit, this is like, because I love doing like folding laundry videos. I love doing mm -hmm. like, and now that um, people are moving out of my space and I'm just going to end up living with my partner, I'm going to be able to like walk around the house naked and yes. like do a bunch of dancing things and do like, my living room's huge. And so I'm very excited. I feel like my content for OnlyFans is going to get so much better in 2023 because I have the freedom also to be yes. loud. Like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. If you've had previously roommates or people in your space that mm -hmm. you need to be conscious of, that's, more difficult absolutely <laughs> and i'm sitting here like using my room as a studio and i'm like i can't wait it's all my siblings my three not all my siblings but three of my okay. siblings out of nine lived with me wow and then i wow. they're slowly <laughs> leaving now because every the lease is coming up and that was what you know i'm getting married all that stuff yeah it's kind of a transition naturally here yes and so i'm like really excited actually okay i wanted to tell you because i'm not an exhibitionist i am a voyeur though hardcore like okay. it's one of my okay. favorite things i'm actually i don't I feel like a robot sometimes when people are watching me because all I'm thinking about is like how to look cute and the skills that go into being like in the moment. So I'm not actually processing that anything else is happening around me. I'm just processing how I feel. But yeah. I'll tell you this, the greatest custom I got asked to do and I almost I almost want to bring it back this particular kind is that I watched somebody masturbate. And then I recorded oh, myself like a reaction. Your reaction. Video. Like I a YouTube love video. That. Yes. It was yes. so great. And you know what was crazy is like I shared, I told him, I was like, do you want the unedited version? He's like completely unedited. And I was Fantastic. like, I, well, I had to apologize, girl, a little bit. He was not offended, but I like gagged and my eyes started to water and I almost felt like vomiting because he did something very normal. Very common, but because I'm so freaking texture sensitive, my brain was like, 
And I was like, this is so normal. Stop it right now, Brittany. And like, I sent it to him and he liked it. He didn't, he wasn't mad. He thought it was He great. wanted a real reaction. And it made me feel so good because I was like, okay, are you sure you're happy with this? Do you want a refund? <laughs> <laughs> I just, <laughs> but it was so nice. He did different angles and different positions, and he got himself into really unique. Like it was really a lovely video. But again, I'm just so sensitive. And which, in some ways, maybe there could be a thing where, like, if you're trying to make me puke on purpose, I'm going to charge you even more in money. Sure, or maybe sure. there could be a thing where I try to make Britney that puke. would totally be a thing. Uh, oh my I'm, gosh, people. I'm really sensitive. Like I'm really. People would that i'm sure I'm they would and i hate <laughs> vomiting i literally hate it so much that maybe that could be a thing but okay so someone could hear me say this and be like Brittany, that's disgusting and i'm like it is kind of disgusting but i also grew up watching jackass my whole life and that is disgusting and like i still fucking yeah. love that shit you know how many times i've watched jackass and they're just like shitting into something or my brother we like look look at this video and all of a sudden someone's just shitting on camera and i'm like what what is this and he's like she's full art People are so fine with, like, grossness in almost every way unless it's, like, a sexual way. Then, like, we're super weird about it. Like, we're, you know, obviously as a society, we're way more comfortable with, like, violence than sexuality. We're comfortable with, like, vomit and, mm -hmm. like, you know, all of these other bodily functions. But the second it's got genitals involved, we get really We weird freak about out. It. We panic. Yeah. Wait, you said something. Oh, my gosh. Wait, you said regular bodily function. Oh, sexual. Okay, I grew up in a very conservative home, Catholic home. Okay. And okay. my parents would let us watch, like, rated R of war movies, no problem. The moment there was, like, an unmarried kiss or the moment there was, like, a bare back showing, it was like, sh 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 turn around. <laughs> right? And so I did grow up in that bubble where, like, sex was more of a consequence or, like, more of an issue than violence. But here was my theory why. We are less likely to kill people. Like I am. My no one in my life has ever killed anyone, right? True. So true, true. but like sex, everybody be doing that. So like a <laughs> part of me wonders if as a parent myself, like, when will I let my kids watch like violent videos versus sexual videos? I think about this all the time with my partner. We're like, hey, is this anime appropriate for like 10 year olds? Or is this more like a 15 year old kid anime? Because there's a lot of yeah. objectifying women, a lot of boob shots, a lot of crotch shots. Is, right. that what, is that the imagery I want to send to a child? Or is this the imagery? So like, that's the question that's always being asked. But yes, that relationship we have with how does violence impact us? How does gross vomiting impact us? How do how does sex come into that? And are we allowed to utilize those two things? with those other things. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Those are really important questions. And those are things that I think about. I don't have any children at this point. Mm. And that's something that I do think about um, for the future. Yeah. Um, I I did not grow up in a conservative household. Ah, whatsoever. okay. <laughs> so my, my experience with it, um, with sexuality was it's just always been a part of human life as mm. far as I've perceived things. Like True. I didn't have, I didn't live in like a totally naked family for, per se, but the first 10 years of my life approximately, um, I lived with my mom and my sister and she was a single mom. And so she's, she's a naked person most totally. of the time. Totally. <laughs> and it was just, you know, just the girls and her. And so she would walk around nude or like, you know, people it would just it was a normal thing she would get yeah. out of the shower and be getting ready and totally um for a while we lived with her best friend and his partner um who were very much into the leather scene uh. in san francisco and they had in the house there was a closet filled with all of the you know <laughs> costumes and accessories and everything and the door was supposed to be locked but like it was left open one time. Yeah. So like, I don't know. I just, I had exposure to different things at different points in time. And it was never like, I was never shamed for asking questions. Like I could walk into the bathroom and he was my godfather mm. could be showering and yeah. he would be naked and he wouldn't be like, ah, don't look. He'd yeah, just yeah, be yeah. like, Hey, I'm taking a shower. Did you need something? You know, just super Very chill. So I normal. never felt like I had to react around a naked body in like a weird way. Um, as far as like explaining things like, the Toms of Finland magnets on the refrigerator. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was just, you know, uh, grownups like to to dress up and, and go to special parties too. And, you know, you can learn more about that when you're an adult. And just like very age appropriate answers. And I would yeah. like to be able to have a similar approach, I guess, where I don't want to hide things. But I do want to make sure that we're still being age appropriate. Okay, I'm curious. Do you remember the conversation we had with Smith? I told a story about how some parents will have, like, their kids will have, like, their 18th birthday party at the dungeon. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so people were like, did everyone just ignore the fact that Brittany just mentioned grooming? And I was like, grooming? And then in my head, I was like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, oh, it's not like the parents are staying at the party when their kids start interacting and like, like if they're doing sexy yeah, stuff, Yeah, right? I think people are misunderstanding. Yeah, like the dungeon party happens, but then usually the parents leave when the party starts because like normal parents... Not all parents want to watch their kids getting vaginally penetrated in front of, like, a bunch of adults. Yeah. Right? Like, general, we don't want to watch our parents and our parents don't want to watch us. Exactly. Like, there are exceptions, but as a as a general As blanker. a general, yes. But funny enough, and I didn't tell this story, but I took my brother to, to the dungeon once. Cause so he, I think siblings can have maybe a different yeah, interaction with different yeah. parents. Well, the rule was, like, he wanted to know what it was, so I brought him to a munch. So, you know, just at a bar. Then mm. we went to a dungeon party on a different night, and people were shook. They're like, wait, is this your real – even at the dungeon, though, they were like, is this your real brother? <laughs> and I was like, yes. And they're like, are you going to do a scene in front of him? And I was like, no, I'm not playing tonight. I'm, I want him to feel safe to play if he wants to, and then I can look another – if he doesn't want me to watch, I can turn around or I can leave. But the point is, is that – who better to bring somebody into a, a, a space than someone who's safe? You know them. You know the rules. Like, who else better to protect my brother but me? Like, who else to protect? Right. You know what I mean? And also, I dated somebody who was second generation kink. Like, who better to mentor you or at least allow you to know the resources than the people who raised you? Like, I don't understand. But then I started to think about it. And I was like, okay, I could see how some people could use this as a way to groom people. Obviously. I'm not stupid. Of course. Obviously. But – Again, for every grooming story, there is a success story about boundaries and safety and consent. And there's something beautiful that people are missing out on. Like I was trying to say to Rhubarb and Smith, like, if you sexualize it at every point, that's fine. But you're missing a completely new experience you could be having, which you don't have to have. You have no obligation to have it. But that's the message my work is centered around. Yes, there's a way to do things. Yes, here's the typical association with this action. Mm -hmm. Here's a brand new way you can consider doing the same thing you've been doing, but in a completely new way. It's like drugs. Yes, you can have it through a joint or oils or <laughs> a fucking edible. It's all going to be different, though. But it's all exactly. Weed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. I really love that analogy because I think that's super my drugs appropriate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say like I grew up again in a in a world where consent and boundaries and things like that were well established from the beginning. Wonderful. Um, I knew how to say no. I knew how to say yes. I knew how to ask permission, things of that nature. Um, but one of the things that drew me to the adult industry mm. um, in like a professional sense um, when I left, wanted to leave the corporate world is how well, again, in my experience, how well people do practice consent and boundaries mm -hmm. and, and how those conversations are kind of normalized and expected before you interact. Um, it felt really comforting to me to yeah. have like this mutual understanding of being respectful of each other's boundaries where I think that is lacking in, I know it's lacking in the corporate world that I worked in, yeah. um, but I think it's lacking in a lot of like everyday like vanilla um, interactions with people, but the adult industry in general does really teach people how to use their voice. I think, well, that's been my experience too, but again, could be a bubble because it's our experience. So we recognize that. I am curious, I suppose. I, I realize the other day we had this great conversation on my discord voice chat where we talked about like, what is consent? What is consent culture? And one of the things that uh, me and my friend kept disagreeing about was like, what is a consent issue? And I said, well, when you're asking people like, can I shake your hand? Can I hug you? That's like a consent question. And he was like, no, that's a good manners question. And I said, well, okay. I so mean, kind of the same thing, right? If you, depending on how you Yeah, it, right? yes. Consent is ultimately good manners, I suppose. I suppose. And so that's There's the question. There's an overlap at least. <laughs> right. And so like for him, he, I think, feels more or less uncomfortable saying like it's a consent thing because then it associates consent culture. But I like consent culture. I'm a big proponent of it. I know it's a, I know it's different. I know it's ob obnoxious to have to be like, do you shake hands? But I don't mind it when I'm in those bubbles. Now, when I'm in a conservative bubbles, I don't even ask because like they wouldn't want me to ask. But again, right. you have to adjust to your audience, too. 
But that takes the like, knowledge that I mm-hmm. have to educate myself on. So when I visit places, I go, what's the neighborhood like? What are the expectations? What's the prominent religion? What's the expectation for modesty? When I solo traveled around the U.S., I was very cautious about what I look like depending on where I was because I didn't mm-hmm. want to rock the boat. I didn't want people to start looking at me and wondering, why is this girl here? She doesn't belong here. Mm-hmm. Right? There's like a way that I was trying yes. to adapt. I didn't always do it correctly. Sometimes people full on called me out. We're like, you're not from here. Where are you from? <laughs> But I tried. (laughs) Guilty. So when I look at my parents, though, and I think about the conversations we had, my mom does this thing that I fully accept as my mom's personality where she'd be like, I know, Betsy, I know you know, but I need to say it out loud for myself. I think being gay (laughs) is wrong. And I was like, I know. I've known that my whole life. I've seen you watch Fox News. I know what you think about gay marriage. She goes, but I need you to know it again currently. And I'm like, I know. And for her, she sees this as a consent for her to be able to be heard. And I see this as an issue where I'm like, I already know this. So, like, you don't have to keep saying it, right? Like, I already right. know. Right. But like, how- I'm going to assume it's the same until you tell me otherwise. Exactly. How do you, in your world, like, kind of balance those conversations i assume the internet's telling you how to be i'm assuming people in your life probably do this to some extent but how do you explain like those consent boundaries right like how when does your consent start and theirs end and so on and so forth that's a good question because i do feel like i naturally find myself falling into like a default almost like a people pleaser like i want Mm. people to be comfortable around me Mm -hmm. i want people to feel like they can be authentic in the space. And so I kind of do the same thing when I travel or when I'm going to different places, I will try to dress appropriately or or kind of dress to the the culture. And I've done it the other way too, especially when I was a lot younger. Mm. Um, I was like, I I don't give a fuck, you know? And I would go walk around Salt Lake City with my freaking mohawk and like, you know, these scantily clad yeah. outfits and my tattoos showing and people are like, <gasps> you know, absolutely been there. And that's kind of fun too. Like I, again, I just, I, I do enjoy people's, ex- I like experiencing other people's experiences reactions. and yeah. perceptions Ooh, and reactions. Yeah. So yeah. To I you. think that's fun. Um, but then I realized as I got a little bit older and I, you know, was, Kind of observing these things that I can actually connect with people more if they don't feel like if I'm in these situations and they don't feel like I'm an outsider or I'm someone different, right? Like if I can be like more approachable, then I benefit too because I get to have these more authentic interactions with them. And yeah. I don't feel like I'm being fake or anything. Like I'm not doing it to the point where I'm sacrificing anything yeah. of who I am, but right. I definitely want to create an environment where that person feels like they can be comfortable and they have room to voice their consent. Um, I've kind of gotten to a point where I know I'm very secure and like solid in what my boundaries are. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have, there's not a lot of things that make me uncomfortable. (laughs) Um, I'm pretty, pretty easily adaptable. Um, So I feel like I'm very chill until like one of my few boundaries are crossed. And then at that point, it's just very much like, you know what, this is actually not okay. And it doesn't need to be like a whole big fucking dramatic scene or whatever, but just like letting people know when they do cross a boundary and um, sort of what, how to, how to walk it back to an appropriate place. Um, Most, I find most often that if I know what their expectations are, then again, I can kind of, manage how how my responses are as well to sort of avoid any awkward situations as best as possible do you do this for any particular reason like can be considerate of people do you ever adapt for any other reason like is there like a moral or ethical is this part of your value system are you doing it out of an obligation to yourself i guess there are elements of all of that yeah like i i definitely I want to treat people, I want to treat people the way that I would want to be treated. Um, I know, obviously, there's a lot of problems in society. There's, you know, all these complicated issues, this, that, and the other. But really, I think my philosophy comes down to it at the end of the day. Like, we're we're all humans just trying to do our best on this planet. So, like, if we can be kind to each other and, and try and yeah. be empathetic and understand maybe where someone else is coming from, then... I really, I just enjoy that feeling of being able to like share a connection with somebody where we feel like we are understanding each other. 
So I guess I kind of seek that out. Okay, curious, because this has been like a conversation we've had a lot on the Discord the last few days about my tendencies. And I, I want to talk to somebody else who maybe, because um, you sound, uh, you do sound similar to, I guess, my brain a little bit, but I have a tendency to have like really strong opinions inward, like in my head. I have very strong opinions about what people are doing with their lives, from like their hair choices down to like their toes. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I have the thoughts. They're there. Yeah. But I have a tendency to be like, whatever, bro, it's fine. Go be, go be you. I don't care. Like, and everyone goes, well, what do you mean you don't care? What do you mean it's fine? Even when people hurt me, I'm like, okay, whatever, bro. That's just like who you are get out of my life or like move aside or hey I'll learn to have a different relationship with you but people um when we have that idea of like I want people to be treated the way I want to be treated the dilemma is that I tend to want to be left alone (laughs) so I tend to do the same to people because like I like my communities and everything but frankly like we have very different reasons why we think we're on this planet and we have very different goals for that time we have here and so I know that ultimately that I'm the only person that I I think I'm my best company and then my partner is my the best company I've ever had. But otherwise everyone gets to see parts of Brittany, but since they can't see all of me, I don't want to be around them all the time because like, you know, it's exhausting to have to like adapt and consider their feelings and talk a different way and dress a different way. So I can not like trigger anyone. It's like, okay. So being by myself is also the best because I don't have to think too much. I'm just like doing my thing with my cat and everything's great. Yes. So when I say things to people like, yeah, it's fine. Like, I don't care if Mr. Girl is Mr. Girl and Lab is Lab and Steven is Steven and all these people are themselves. Like, I don't care. Go be yourselves. And then I'll decide how I want to interact with that version of yourself. For Lav and Mr. Girl, you got blocked. <laughs> but that's because I'm too old to deal with that amount of like up and down oh, yo-yoing. Geez. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And some people felt bad. Like some people were like, well, why aren't you helping Lav? Like you should look out for her. But the thing is, is like I already have like all these callers all these other people and none of those people have had or needed to like spread rumors about whether or not I have fucked my coworkers. Right. And lab decided to make that decision. So when she made that decision, I also had to make the decision to block her, which I think is fine though. I think it's fine that lab is having her own version of reality and like going through it, but that doesn't mean I have to interact with it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same. Oh my gosh. I feel that a lot. Um, I also choose to like, step out of situations frequently. And I do require a lot of time to myself to like recharge and just be myself, not feel like I'm being on, not feel like I'm reading other people's reactions yeah. and thinking, what are they thinking and all of that. Um, so I definitely allow myself time to decompress and and to step away, mm-hmm. um, both in real life and online. Um, mm. And I think that that's been, like such an important, such an important boundary for me is that like when a lot of internet drama blows up, you know, people are are talking about me yeah. and like in front of these huge audiences, you know, and like, oh, well, Madam Genevieve thinks this and Madam Genevieve says this and this, that and the other. And part of me initially is like, oh, like I should call and jump in and like explain like what I really think, right? Yeah. But then I'm kind of like, I'm kind of man. I've already said what I think. Like if anybody actually cares, like it's already yeah. out there on the internet. So and- why do you not? Because you identified as like a feminist, sex positive feminist in the beginning, which insinuates in my brain a form of activism. Sometimes I think people think my passivity is like a lack of activism, but I retired from being an activist. But with you, do you ever feel like you're obligated to then make a statement so people know what you think? Or can mm-hmm. you just be like, whatever, bro, it's fine. You do you. I do feel that and I try to balance it with because I ultimately know like whatever it's fine you do you it doesn't matter etc like Mm -hmm. that's that's really where where I'm operating from I feel like my activism is it speaks loudest through like just the way that I live my life and the way that I choose to conduct myself right so I shouldn't have to constantly be like calling into streams and like trying to like shout it from a rooftop, this, that, and the other. Like, I'd rather just show people with with how I live my life. And, and if yeah. they want to see that and be a part of it, that's really cool. But um, I'd rather demonstrate it, I guess. And I do participate still in activism in real life selectively when mm-hmm. I feel like it can be effective and when I feel like I can contribute in a way that's actually positive and purposeful. 
Um, for me, a lot of that comes from education. Um, mm. One of my major goals for this upcoming year is to finish my sex educator certification. Oh, fun. Um, so I can be like actually legitimate. Um, I've been studying human sexuality for my entire adult life. Um, and, and I'm really excited to like actually be certified soon. So, That's really great. Um, Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank I like you. that. Thank you. Okay. Curious philosophy question. Okay. Yes. I want to know why you think like we're here as a species, not like in the, oh, our purpose is to procreate, but like literally like, why are we even on the planet? Like, do you have any inkling? What do you believe? My beliefs from like a philosophy and spiritual standpoint are really like cherry picked from a lot of different mm. philosophies Love and that. religions, et Same. cetera. Um, I think that I, I kind of simultaneously feel like we're here, like, like life exists just by coincidence, like mm. without any real purpose or significance. Like it just is like a scientific effect or like a biological chemical reaction of some sort. So I kind of approach sometimes from, from that perspective where I'm like, well, none of it matters. We're yeah. all just like a bunch of cells and, you know, that's just how the energy worked out. Um, but then that's sort of balanced with the fact that there seems to be something special with the way that like the compounds and energy and everything have interacted on this planet to create this, this moment and us as beings and, and everything. Yeah. So that feels almost like maybe too much of a coincidence to just be like a whatever thing. Um, I, I think ultimately we're, our, our purpose really is to experience love. If, mm. if I had to like really nail it down, I think yeah. that knowing what, what like real unconditional true love is, is something that is so fundamental to the human experience and is really different. I think than a lot of other animals and living beings kind of feel mm -hmm. um, that we love so that we can understand. Like, Oh, I know hi, my, my kitty mouse. cat loves me. This Thank is you. little coconut. Hi, coconut. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he so cute? He's like, hi, oh, Brittany. Oh, how cute. <laughs> I know he loves me. I know we have a loving relationship, but it's a little bit different than the yeah. way like two can can have that um, experience. And I think I do believe in reincarnation. I think that Ooh. a lot of us have to live multiple lifetimes before we can really experience like pure, genuine, selfless love. Yeah, um, and kind of know how that looks both to love yourself and to love someone else. Um, and ultimately love all of humanity, I think is probably the greatest lesson that, that we're kind of striving for. Um, I don't know. That sounds really hippy dippy, but it's no, no, I love like it. I'll ride this love train with you, girl. Cause I think it's, I think it's 100. No, I think um, I've watched so many different philosophers talk about like the meaning of existence. Like what does it mean to be a person? And like the root of it always seems to go back to versions of love. So That's the best word I can possibly yeah. think of, right? Yeah. It's like almost like a love encompasses all things, like a sense of responsibility, which, mm -hmm. you know, ties into our work life. A love, you know, a commitment and dedication, which moves into, you know, there's just so much of love to be explored. Right. And I will say that I think the more you love and the more introspective you are, the less violent and the less um, – um, just abrasive you tend to be, not in terms of personality, mm -hmm. but in terms of your desire to hurt others. I have never been more peaceful in my life than now, still aggressive personality wise, but I just don't, I just don't want to fight people the way I used to want to fight people. Like I used to want to pull mm -hmm. people's hair out of their scalp. I was so upset with their decisions. And now I'm just like, I don't know, bro. Sounds like you're on. Yeah. Journey. Sounds like this is where your <laughs> life led you. And this is where the contention comes in. So here's my theory. I'm going to bounce off your idea and say that it is love to see and be seen, to love and be loved is the purpose of the human being, the human like consciousness. The dilemma is that because love is so versatile and diverse and different for all of yes. us, we grit, we, we have contention with how love is expressed. Have you ever, mm -hmm. um, I've said this a bunch of times, but like, I think when you get two good people together who aren't meant to be together, they become bad people. 
They don't mean to, but they really bring out the worst in each other, right? So when you're with the Mm -hmm. right person, the reason people will say, and this is like very bubbly, you'll know when you know. The person will bring you peace. You'll feel (laughs) at ease. I'm starting to realize that now with my fiance now, I didn't, I'm trying to realize like, why is this relationship working? Why is this the one that's working? Why did the other ones not work? Why are you marrying this person? (laughs) And I've never wanted to be married before. And the moment, like literally a couple weeks into talking to him, I was like, something is different. What is different? And it's not just that we're talking about philosophy and that I want to pick his brain about everything. Something is literally different. And I think the way he shows love and the way I receive love is complimentary. The way I give love and the way he receives love is complimentary. Our love Mm -hmm. matches. Yes. Yes. People talk about love languages and how you need to obviously utilize those and be aware of different things. And that's really applicable I yes, think you're yes you, you have to be compatible and two people can be great I've had relationships with people who are fan fucking tastic mm. people but mm-hmm. they're not they're not the person for me yeah. right like they don't bring out the best of me ultimately and I don't yes. bring out the best of them ultimately so Ooh, you know we're, okay. we're gonna go and <laughs> I'm so excited about this conversation because like my friend Q and I just did a podcast about this. Um, and then I talked about it with other people where like loving someone means allowing them to make you a better person. Right. And so mm-hmm. but they can't do that unless your love matches because otherwise it feels. Yes. Hear me out. It's why I have contention with my parents who I love so much. Where I'm like, I love you both. You can love me by like backing off. And they're like, no, I need to love you this way. But because our love doesn't match, it creates like an issue. When yeah, they're very, a- they're very good people, right? They're like so lovely that I'm like, please just stop. I love you. And you know that they're doing it because they want to help you. They're like, they're they're coming from a place of good intentions, yes. of course. But like, it's just not effective. It's not. And it's, if anything, and I, you know, we're having these really great conversations now. I'm telling you, therapy gave me so many tools. Good. Well, we're having these conversations now we couldn't have before as a family where, like, they won't be able to recognize my marriage because it's not Catholic, which is fine. But one of the things that – when I say it's fine, I don't mean that I'm not emotionally distraught as their daughter. I mean, logically, as a grown-up adult, I've accepted that my parents are these people and I respect their religious choices. Right, okay? right. Like, people need to understand. You can still have feelings about it. Exactly. And- be accepting of it <laughs> exactly so it is fine because i don't want people to say because i don't think i can tell a religious person it's like me going to a muslim and being like you must eat pork like who the fuck am i to go to that right. person and be like hey i need you to eat pork it's like get, yeah. just eat don't eat pork if you don't want to eat pork bro yeah like i don't you, care you, right? you do you yeah you do you so. right but i think the mixture of activism as love Telling people your thoughts as love, like minding your own business as love. These are all different versions of love. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so the Um, chaos comes from when those bubbles interact, though. And like the way you show love is like bothering me or like breaking my consent. Right. Yes. I think that we we experience that frequently with our parents, right? Because they, they do find themselves in a role where they are guiding us and helping us navigate the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But there's something about the child-parent relationship Mm. where that form of showing love through constantly telling and telling and dictating just generally is going to cause rebellion, at least in my experience. Total 100. Nobody taught me to lie and be rebellious as much as my parents. (laughs) You know? I think that's true. Like... Things that I, I mean, th- I was allowed to do certain things and not allowed to do other things. And, you know, obviously yeah. thing, there's nuance, et cetera, et cetera. But, like, being told you can't do something is obviously going to make you want to do it even more, at least in my mind. And that's yeah. how, that's, yeah. That's, well, I want to test it out. React. I'm curious. <laughs> the problem is, like, I'm such a curious human. I have been since I was young. I mean, to the point where... I would have been canceled at four years old because, like, apparently my mom would tell stories of how I would go up to my aunts or uncles and be like, so why are you, like, fat? What's up with that? And, like, I was just curious on, like, why they decided <laughs> to be that way. Just ask they just the ask the real questions. But I actually think it's a really good question to ask myself. Like, why do I want muscles? Like, why do I want big arms? Why yeah. do I hold my vessel this way? Why do I want, like, my hair to be naturally curly? Like, why don't I straighten my hair anymore? Why don't I do things? I think it's a, the why is so important to my brain. So when people come up to me and they're like, I want to date you. And I'm like, why? They're like, what do you mean, why? And I'm like, well, why do you want to date me? 
they're like, oh, we have like lots in common and like I like you. And I'm like, great. Why would I want to date you? And they're like, well, I'm great and I'm awesome. I'm like, yeah, we're all great and awesome. Is this really the reason we're dating people? Because they're great and awesome? Right, right. That's <laughs> not very compelling. <laughs> I relate to that a lot. I'm a very curious person as well. Mm, yeah. um, Alice in Wonderland was always my favorite Disney movie. Yes, <laughs> love it. Just chasing her curiosity. Um, when I was in elementary school, like the motto or the question that they taught us to really like look through, and I'm still thinking of this, you know, almost 30 years later is what am I doing and why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so crucial to like stop and ask yourself because it, a lot of times we are kind of going on autopilot and it's like well wait I don't actually know the answer to either of those questions or maybe you can answer one like maybe I know what I'm doing yeah. but I don't really know why I'm doing it right um so I like to still find myself in the in put, put what I'm doing through that perspective through that filter so like along your life you've obviously made a lot of choices that have led you to be this person out of yes. all the Genevieves you could have been, out of all the versions of you you could have been, because I'm sure you have hobbies and interests that are maybe light, like 10% of your time, but what if they turned into 90? Like, why did you choose 100% of your time as this person? I like to think, I like to imagine the other Genevieves out in, like, different multiverses. <laughs> like, Me what, too. what are they doing, right? Like, because there are so many choices that I've made over my life that would have led me in so many different directions yeah. from... What I studied in college, I changed my major partway through. So what if I hadn't done that, right? What if, what if I had pursued my original, what I thought was my original direction? Um, what if I had stayed in the corporate world? Ah. What, what if I... We never would have met. Hadn't... Exactly, exactly. Sad. Um, there's so many people, so many of like my best friends now that I would never even know. Like, that's wild. What if I had never moved to Las Vegas? Like... All of these things that are big life decisions have these huge, obvious um, consequences. So there's, you know, the potential that there's these other Genevieves mm -hmm. that are living these totally different lives. Um, the reason that I find myself living this path and following this path is is really purposeful. Um, I I knew that the other paths were not going to make me feel fulfilled. Mm. Um, one thing that I haven't really talked about on stream a lot, not that it's a secret, I've mentioned it here and there, and it's it's public information, is that I was, I, I had, um, I was diagnosed with a metastatic endocrine cancer when I was 14. Oh my gosh. So uh, like a super rare diagnosis. Um, I had three different varieties of tumor. Um, and it was growing really, really fast. Oh God. And so like by the time that I first felt sick to when I was in this intensive surgery was the period of a couple weeks. Whoa. And this was happening the summer before I started high school. Oh my God. And it was like the biggest mind fuck that anybody can imagine, right? Like <laughs> that's not what anybody is expecting. And then because it was such a strange diagnosis in case I had to go to these, you know, very specific specialists and they would be like oh, I've been studying medicine for 60 years and I've only ever read about this and like it's just wild stuff um I had to at this crazy young age really think about like what what am I doing and why am I doing it like I have limited time on this planet we all have limited time on this planet but it becomes very real and very tangible in a situation like that where you you could have months, you could have years, you could have decades, you really don't know. And obviously none of us know. Um, but with that in mind, I felt like the only thing that I could control was how I choose to spend the present moment and how I how I make decisions based on where I'm at at that point. And, and like, obviously you want to plan for the future and you want to like, be mindful of what could happen in the long term, but trying to be trying to be joyful and present in the moment ultimately mm. leads me down a path that feels joyful in the long term. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going to ask a question that's um, okay. Certain bubbles could react certain ways to it. Um, when we talk about following our joy, this is separate from our emotional happiness, right? Cause happiness is like an emotion in flux, right? 
Yeah. You know, um, I don't always experience happiness. Sometimes people die and I'm sad. But most of the time, even when I'm sad, I'm pretty joyful. Now, I'm about three, four years into that process. Um, stopped suicidal ideations. Now it's just like a huge cope when I say I'm going to kill myself. It's me just like knowing that I have the option in case it gets too overwhelming. But like, okay, I'm not going to do it's it. In your back pocket. <laughs> yeah, just like, just like in case, okay. Um, but when we say that, when we say like follow your joy – I think when I was in the craziness of my borderline and I was in the craziness of my PTSD and I, I didn't know what to do about what I was experiencing before therapy and stuff, um, I felt like joy was sort of like a privileged option. But then after I found it, I felt like it was the only option and privilege had little to do with it. I felt instead of thinking about it as like privilege, I thought about it as the introspect instead of the extrospect. Think about what you can do versus what they do to you. Yes. Yeah. You know? But the problem is, is like so much of what I do is can be dependent on what they do. And so mm-hmm. you're going back and forth, always looking at the what I call. So I call existing you like Genevieve is existing and everything outside of Genevieve is existence. And so we are always at. We were always at a crossroads with existence. When I move through my life and I say, like, just let me be a sex worker. And then I hear my friend Steven and my friend Abba get on fucking stream and talk about in all the ways, like, OnlyFans is not helping people cope correctly. And they should maybe for the betterment of society, get rid of it. I'm like, sir, like, this is where my existence is now interacting with my existing. And I'm like, you're cock blocking my success because the thing that brings me joy, you're trying to take it away from me. Yes. So yes. <laughs> this is my biggest struggle when I'm sitting here. Like, my existing is great. Brittany never wants to die when she's just living her life. She only wants to kill herself when she has to deal with existence. It's like, I'm going to take away your livelihood, your sense of mm. self, your ability to vote. I'm like, men are, I don't know what these political bubbles are talking about. And they're like, women shouldn't be able to vote. I'm like, is this a joke? Is, I, yeah. is this a joke? Like, oh why God. are we even talking about are this? Are we having this conversation? Really? Like, like, why? <laughs> like, why are we having it? And so, again, I'm always on edge because of what they do. They being anyone outside of me. Including my own parents who don't want to validate mm-hmm. my marriage or validate the queer lifestyle or validate sex work. And I'm saying, I want to live and let live. I want you to be religious. I want you to be whoever you are. But can we not rape, kill, like unjustly fire? Like, can we talk about avoiding all the black and white thinking so we can kind of be cohesive within the diversity, right? Because ultimately, yeah. I feel like this is where joy leads us. But it's very hard to convey this to people, especially when I sound like a privileged girl who's just, quote unquote, been an OnlyFans girl who's never had a real job. <laughs> if I say one more time, when OnlyFans isn't even my main hustle. It's not my main hustle. <laughs> Seriously, yes. I, oh. Yeah, it's not my main hustle either. Like, mm. I wish I could say I was making six figures I, on OnlyFans. Fuck not yes. the fucking case. If I could okay? make six figures on OnlyFans, fuck <laughs> all my callers. Bye, bitch. Like, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, just kidding. But, like, I'm not that person. Like, I don't have the wherewithal to be cute 24-7. It's not my job. I'm a thinker 24-7, though. Hence the reason my main priority, my main job is thinking. I think for a living, but I don't get, right. I'm not going to get any of that credit from the bubbles. So that's fine. Right? <laughs> That's fine. Right. But what do you think about that? Like bounce ideas off with me about joy. And then when you have to deal with like existing versus existence, like how do you counter, like how do you maintain your joy in a world that's always one step away from trying to like stop you? That's, that's really profound because it is so easy to give into that kind of clash. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned being opinionated. I'm also really opinionated and I, I tend to think that, you know, I have the right answers. <laughs> I have really good advice. <laughs> and, okay. All of these things. Yes. And maybe, I, maybe I don't. That's, a, that's a, I guess, up for debate. Um, I think that part of my journey has been about realizing that in order for me to find my joy and to allow other people to find and seek out theirs, we all just kind of have to, like, surrender to the fact that I ultimately, I, I, I can't control you. I shouldn't control you. I don't want to control you. Like yeah. I want you to fully do you. And while I may have my own thoughts and opinions on how I might do something differently, if I were in your shoes, I'm just not like, I'm not in anybody's shoes except my own. Um, and nobody else is in mine conversely. Right. So like that recognition of, we all, so the only thing we all really have any control over um, is just 
our inner selves and our inner like perception and how we react and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that kind of brings me peace a little bit. Do you believe in free will? I do. I do. Okay. Yeah. How does that coincide with reincarnation? I'm curious because I've only read um, Canon Dolores, Dolores Canon, Dolores Canon on uh, reincarnation and she's very interesting and all that, but I don't really believe in much like as a person. I just come and open to anything that's true and then I basically believe in very little. Yeah. So I say I believe in reincarnation, but I don't believe, I don't think that like if I were to 100% compare my personal interpretation of reincarnation with like I don't know these other like official mm. more structured versions I'm yeah. sure a hundred percent that that my interpretation of it is different and is okay. impacted differently fair, fair, fair. um and that's really how I am with with any kind of religious perspective or spirituality is it's kind of like similar but maybe not a hundred percent the same so I guess I'm using the word I believe in reincarnation because from what I've seen and from what I understand, you know, obviously we all talk about how like energy can't be destroyed. It can only be transferred. And so I think of reincarnation kind of through that lens. Um, And I do also, we talked about like different multiverses. I do believe that there are, there's energy that's existing in different um, planes that we can't necessarily perceive. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, free will kind of plays into that because every every unique decision or choice could take you and probably does take you down a different path mm-hmm. and um whatever your lived experiences in this reality um is a direct result of the free will you've had previously okay curious what um like, how did that journey start that led you to believing in, like, because I don't, again, like, I really have, once I went through this own, my own introspection journey, it was really hard for me to believe in much. But the, so I see belief, let me just, I see belief as a, like, a literal belief. I believe in this. I don't know if it's real, but I'm going to live my life through this belief, which is wonderful. I think I, the one belief I hold very dear to my heart is that I believe most people are good. I have no way to prove this. So it is a belief, right? It's just something that I think is what so I live my life based off of that belief. But for you, yeah. like you must have come to a place like what was the journey to think of like multitude of like multiple universes and planes and all these like what was the journey? I I know you love to read. I also love to read. Um and when I was younger, I would often read like I taught myself how to read when I was 4 years old. Awesome. I've been an avid reader my entire life. Um I would read a book a day in elementary school. Amazing. And then when I was in high school going through all of my medical treatments and everything, I had to be in isolation a lot of the time. And so mm-hmm. an escape for me was to to read everything that I could get my hands on. Um, I'm really pretty nerdy in that regard. I like reading science. I like reading history. I like reading memoirs. I like reading philosophy. I love that. Just everything but one of my favorites is memoirs um Mm. it comes back to the fact that i i'm always curious about other people's experiences and how they might be similar to mine or different than mine um and what that looks like and i think that my my overall life philosophy is really just bits and pieces of what i've kind of picked up from how other people have experienced the world and how um how that seems to be true in my experience as well yeah yeah I can see that now are you um switching over to I was thinking about your relationship because you're in a you're engaged but you're in an open relationship yeah okay yes and we've mm -hmm. go ahead I was gonna say we've been together for nine years but we've just more recently opened the relationship in in recent time okay yeah what is it about him that made you pick him (laughs) so we <laughs> we met um, when I first moved from San Francisco to Southern California. I was transferred for work um, mm. and I felt really lonely and like didn't really know anybody in this new area, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I went on the uh, online dating sites, right? Like great way to meet people. 
Um, and he was actually, so I was on OK Cupid. Oh, this coffee. was in 2013. Um, okay. And, you know, you fill out a lot of info. It's not like the other ones where it's yeah. just photo based or whatever. <clears throat> There's a lot of questions and shit. Um, and so anyways, I do that and then I get my matches and he's my number one match. Um, and I'm like, all right, well, let me look and see who this guy is. Right. We have like some like 90 something percent compatibility. Um, I'm like intrigued. That's much higher than my compatibility with like the other people. Plus he's not bad on the eyes. Let's go. Let's go. Meeting. Uh, you know, the uh, preferences that I have for a male partner in, in that regard. Um, and so I read his little bio and looked through and I was like even more intrigued. And we started interacting. We met in person really, really quickly. Um, I don't, I'm not somebody who likes to just have like endless online yeah. um, interaction with somebody that I do want to have like a real relationship with. If, if I want to have a real relationship, then I would like to meet face to face as soon as possible. For sure. um, and, and so we went on our first date and it was just one of those feelings where like, so stupid but like you just kind of know like it just <laughs> I love so it dumb. but like it just felt very different than yeah. like interactions that I have had been in before it felt like I could be relaxed like I could just be right yeah. um and it just it felt like we had enough in common and enough not in common to mm. have healthy conflict and and be able to share new experiences and bubbles with each okay. other. Uh, you know, like I got to introduce him to like the sex work and adult industry and kink world. Yeah. Um, he's a musician, so he got to kind of bring me into this rock star lifestyle, which yeah. is really cool um, and fortunately very complimentary. Um, but when we met, we both were working in like the corporate world, but like we knew that we wanted to, to kind of branch out of that. And so it's been really cool because one reason that I know that we're so good together and that we are like the right fit, if you will, yeah. is that we've been really good at encouraging the other person to independently chase their own joy and to figure out really, okay, what what is going to make you feel like you're you're living your best self and you're living your most yeah. authentic self and what steps can we take like in the real world to make that happen um which is really awesome because a lot of people will be willing to have these conversations about like what do you want to do what are your dreams this that and the other but being able to actually take action to make them come true yeah. is just fucking awesome and i've been able to really come into myself and realize who I want to be and and what kind of life I want to live and mm -hmm. um, have support, which is awesome. Uh, I'm curious, was there ever a fear? Because if you guys are in your mid thirties now, you guys met in your twenties and that's really scary because mm -hmm. you're going to grow and you're going to change. And then you're facilitating and saying to your partner, like, what is your joy? How did you guys handle that fear of what if your joy isn't with me? <laughs> so we it, it's not been like a totally smooth sailing nine-year relationship I sure. think most long-term relationships are gonna have bumps and hiccups totally. etc cetera, etc cetera. um and we definitely went through a period where we struggled with that and we separated and we struggled with how do I commit to this one person mm. for the rest of my life and you know how do I give up on all the other people if I choose this person and what does that mean and um Am I making the right choice? And, and just all of these questions. And yeah. in our time apart, it really reiterated that we were better together. Um, and we had to reevaluate if we do want to come back together, if we do want to like do this again, like I'm, I, we're not going to do it a third time. Right. right. Like, <laughs> right. So, so this is going to be it. Like for real, we're going to, we're going to talk about all of these, what ifs and these scary possibilities um, and then figure out like, is this really what we want to do? And I think that that's, that was a really difficult time, but also like a really positive time. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we were able to share our fears with each other and kind of just be really honest <clears throat> and, and direct in a way that 
you know that we we were able to to come to an understanding that for us unconditional love is unconditional it doesn't mean that i only love you and want to be your partner as long as you're not attracted to someone else yeah or um i only want to love and be your partner um under the circumstance that we get married and have 2.5 kids and live in a house with a white picket fence yeah or so on and so forth um for us you know it's it's truly unconditional love and trust regardless of those things mm-hmm. and once we kind of were able to step outside of the like oh well should I tell my partner this because what if what if how I'm feeling or what if I'm thinking is going to hurt them right to being able to say things that might sometimes feel possibly hurtful but know that they're not met with the intention of actually trying to do harm to that person yeah um, and so part of our journey has been honesty <laughs> communication um and that is really how we led how we ended up in an open relationship today mm. is is that we were able to realize that our our bond isn't it doesn't have to look like the traditional monogamous situation right. and when we met 9 years ago I very much was still working for corporate um living in my mind this concept of you know doing the right thing and climbing the ladder and then you're going to meet someone and get engaged and get married and then have a baby and buy a house and you know, all of like the typical shit, (laughs) like, you know, like maybe, maybe that's not what our life looks like. And in trying to make our life fit that we were making ourselves unhappy. So once we realized that we could let go of that um, and kind of write our own rules, so Mm -hmm. to speak, um, we've both just been on solid ground. Okay. So I use bubbles even in my own relationship where I'm like, let's make our own bubble relationship, like our relationship bubble. Like this is okay. whatever we want. So I don't like tell me how your parents were. Tell I'll tell you how my parents were. But in general, I want him and I to always be able to sit down and say like, hey, so you want to leave this part of the relationship? Like, can we talk about it again? I'm like, yeah. What do you want to do? Do you want to change it? Because like we can. Now, I for my yes. mental health do need consistency. But I'm so open to change as long as it's what will facilitate our joy. So even this morning, we had like a really nice, like I made breakfast and drank my coffee while he was like heading to bed because we're on a nine hour difference. Opposite. Okay. Yeah. So and so he um, we're sitting there, you know, we're talking and I said, hey, um, Lex Friedman tweeted something and I thought it was funny. And he goes, what? And I was like, it was a Bob Marley quote about how um, eventually everybody will hurt you. And I've been really thinking about that idea because I wonder, you know, sometimes why people hurt other people. And obviously I think the road to hell is paved in good intentions. I, th- I believe that very much. <laughs> yes, you know? absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. And I so, say that a lot. Yeah. And I have to assume these good intentions are causing a lot of pain, but how can I, how can I hate someone for having good intentions? Right. So like, let's have right, a conversation. Right. And I asked him, I was like, how much do you think we're going to hurt each other in this relationship? He's like, hopefully very minimally, but it will happen. Right. He's like, we've Mm -hmm. already, he's like, we've already done it a few times. And I was like, oh, but those weren't, oh, okay, hold on. Those didn't last more than a day, but they were still, and could have been something that lasted many years if we didn't solve it in that moment. So they were still intense for the 24 hour period. The issue lasted and we're so new. We're baby relationship. So we are going, we are heading in to that nine year stretch that you're in now. We're going to, that's going to be a second from now, but like we are, you know what I mean? We don't know what's going to come up, but we want to make the dedication and the commitment that together as a team, we will tackle what happens regardless of how it occurs. Maybe I bring it up. Maybe he causes it. Maybe the existence causes it. Maybe, and maybe, 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 but together we will tackle this because that's where the only part of commitment we can make is, is that we'll do this as a team and I won't hide it from you. I won't lie to you. I won't deceive you. I won't cheat on you. If I feel a desire, because we're monogamous right now, if I feel a desire, he feels a des- desire to truly open the relationship. Let's have that conversation. There's no right. threat to us as a unit having, I did open for 10 years. So like I'm, I absolutely could do it again if we needed to. But as as of right now, I'm a little bit in that possessive position where I'm like, yeah, I just want you for myself currently. So like, yeah, nobody yeah. else right now. Um, And he feels the same. But maybe nine years from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe five years from now, we sit down and say, hey, I really want to do this OnlyFans shoot. And that feels like opening the relationship, even though it's not. And it's for work. Maybe this right. will constitute opening the relationship even for work. 
is that okay? Let's yeah. talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I love, yeah. It's so crucial. And oh, knowing, again, I, I also do, I like consistency. I like having, like, stability, a yes. good foundation, et cetera, et cetera. But I also know that if you're not willing to be flexible, that your foundation can crack, right? Yes. Like, I grew up in San Francisco. You need the buildings to move with the earthquake. Otherwise, <laughs> it's all just going to fall down. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's exactly the imagery I love, too, is, like, instead of being rocked by the thing that's killing like, – you know how they say in car accidents, it's better to, like – move with the like don't fight yeah it. then to like brace yes. yourself yeah I feel like people out of fear brace and I think fear is the path like fear is the root of all evil mm-hmm. I think like absolutely fear is connected to that good intentions oh I'm afraid for you let me save your soul by giving you conversion therapy and I'm like whoa <laughs> yes yeah you know? people people are afraid of things that they don't understand or that they feel like isn't right for them and so then they want to have this good intention trying to take somebody out of what they maybe perceive as a scary yeah. situation. Yeah. Um, but that's not their role. <laughs> one thing that I, oh, please, please, go ahead. please. No, I don't oh, remember. One thing. Okay. Okay. Hold on to it. I was just gonna say one thing that I think is really is kind of a similar mindset for, for choosing your partner is at least in my mind and in my relationship, you, we don't know how it could change your mold over the next several decades of our life that hopefully we do spend together. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but one thing that we do know is that we are committed to this team. We're committed to, to being, to approaching whatever these obstacles are together. Um, I've always loved the idea that in our society, (laughs) we get to choose a partner that like essentially the rest of the world recognizes as like your family member or your teammate. Um, and, I think that's really special. And I think that having that, that as a foundation is really crucial. Yeah. It's interesting. How, how, oh, hold on. (laughs) We got a backlog now. (laughs) Oh, okay. So over the course of this whole conversation, there's obviously been this theme of interacting with people who think differently than you, even in moments, maybe your own partner. It's like, oh, how do we problem solve this difference? How do you personally, like what tools do you use to sort of meet people where they are and also make peace with the idea that maybe someone in another relationship wants pure monogamy. Maybe somebody else wants only open and thinks the other is bad. Maybe somebody wants and is okay with cheating. Maybe somebody isn't. Like, how do you make peace with having an internal judgment and then also having people in your life, if you do, that have their relationships that are totally different from you? Like, do you ever have an issue with anyone and how they do things? So again, I do do find myself being an opinionated person, but less and less so, honestly, like as I've Mm. gone through my life and I feel like I've been able to really intellectualize things. I think I was probably much more judgmental 10 years ago, even five years ago. Yeah. Um, and and I've really gotten to the point where I can completely be okay with the fact that how I do something or how I would do something, the decisions that I would make are not going to be the same as the decisions that other people make. And that is totally okay. It's totally fine. Yeah. They're their decisions to make because I, I want to be the one making my decisions. I don't want anyone to tell exactly. me. Exactly. So I need to allow other people that same space. Yeah. It's funny. I do this thing where I, I have – um. Haven't made always make made the greatest decisions. And so like I have a part of me that's really doubtful of even this relationship that I'm in prior to getting engaged. I was like, okay, guys, we're like a month in. I'm feeling very overwhelmed with how much I feel compatible with this human, this consciousness that is him. And I'm feeling very compelled to marry him and be with him. Yes, I know we're 30 days in. Please, everybody breathe. I need and I'm reaching out to my inner circle so you guys can sit me down and ask me every question that could destroy the illusion of this love I have for this man so I can break up with him if I need to. Does anyone have any, anything, anything? And everything they brought up, the counter to it was so easy. I'm like, nope, you give me something real. Give me a real reason that I'm making a mistake here. And then and then they asked me, um, like in particular, they were like, well, are you asking us because you're actually going to listen to us? I was like, I'm asking you because I've already made the decision in my head and I'm trying to roll it back in case I didn't think of something I could have thought of but I feel like I've been very thorough because we did more of a courting version of dating 
We did it with the purpose of getting married. I don't want to live with anyone unless we're married. I've done that too many times and I hate moving people out. It's a pain in the ass. I'd rather just fucking fly to Europe to visit him (laughs) if I have to. Like, girl, I cannot, okay? And then I figure um, I don't want to date for a year or two years. Like, I really like my life. I love my sense of peace. I would really prefer if we just went through all the hard questions first and then we went to the easiest stuff because the easy stuff is easy. Are we compatible sexually? I, I'm pretty sure we, we will we will be. That's not the hard part. The hard <laughs> yeah, part is... That's and, the easy part. <laughs> that's the easy part. The hard part is whether or not we're going to want to raise kids similarly or whether or not we internally mm-hmm. as individuals are at peace with like sex work. Finding a man or even a woman that is comfortable with me being on OnlyFans, holy fucking shit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That alone. It's major and and I feel really excited that I found a man who initially met me when I was working oh. you know a uh, corporate corporate like good girl job yeah. <laughs> I mean I worked for Disney for fuck's sake like how Whoa. much more <laughs> how much more good girl can you get um but I mean also I mentioned he's he's like in the rock scene so he probably oh, likes oh good point wait girl gone bad element I think that's working in, in my favor <laughs> But I mean, one day I was like, I think I want to be nude on the internet, you know? <laughs> like, What did he say? How did it go? He was like, yeah, you know, nude modeling seems to make you oh really happy. Like, you are somebody who's comfortable naked. If you want to share that with the world, fucking do it. Yes. Let me help you set up your website. Like, <gasps> oh, how fantastic. sweet. Like, no, this is a big deal. Fantastic. That is a big deal. Like, I'm telling you right now. Every, especially in the bubble I grew up in, everyone was telling me, like, you're never going to find a person, Brittany. Man or woman, no one's ever, who wants their, like, wife on the internet naked? And I was like, right. I feel like I know a lot of people who are okay with that in certain bubbles, but maybe they're, like, maybe not in the bubble I'm in. So I was like, I wasn't freaking out. I believe we have compatibility with, like, millions of people on the planet. It's just a matter of, like, will we meet them? Right. Will we find them? And when? And when, and when, because I tell you right now, if I met my partner three years ago, I wouldn't have been ready for him. Right. That makes such a difference as well. You you not only have to meet the right person, but you have to meet them at the right time. I think so. I do. I really, really heavily believe in that. So I think we meet people that we're so compatible with on a percentile. So I'm really big with numbers. I like comfort of it. They're not real math. They're Britney math. So they're cheating math. But like, you know, I like a 80% compatibility rate about the core, like the core parts of the self. Yeah, I you know, think that's good. I like like some sort of like reassurance that we at least have similar values. So that's why I ask all the weird, uncomfortable questions first date. Because a lot of people, oh, but then I listen to how easily they agree with the OnlyFans thing. If they're like, yeah, "Yeah, I love that. Totally. No problem. I'm like, "Uh -uh." what is your opinion on nudity? What is your belief around being naked? What is the philosophy you hold yourself to? Why are you okay with OnlyFans? Because a lot of people do this. Oh, I'm okay with OnlyFans. Oh, I thought when we got married, you'd get off it. Yes. There's this like joke I think that I hear a lot with OnlyFans models and with strippers too because I have a lot of friends who dance here in Vegas Mm -hmm. where it's like they're cool with it but then as soon as you're official right like you're gonna stop like you're only doing it until you meet the right person and get swept off your feet and get married or et cetera et cetera and exactly it's like I'm going to save you and take you away from all this sort of a thing. Like, well, no, this is, this is actually like what I enjoy doing. So like, yeah. let's talk about that, you know, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what we, cause there, uh, no, don't get me wrong. I, 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 a friend asked, a friend of a friend asked me this the other day. He asked me like, if you had like $5 million, basically, would you keep working? And I'm like, Oh, probably not. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I mean, I would work and it wouldn't really be work at that point, right? It would just be showing up on screen. It wouldn't really be like, when I work OnlyFans, so I charge $20 a month for my OnlyFans. I feel like that's a big price. I yeah, feel that's like, a higher, right? higher monthly subscription than a lot of people do. I feel like it's expensive. And because I feel like it's expensive, I feel an obligation to post a certain mm-hmm. amount of times a month. Um, and I, I always try to like, at least in my head, I'm like, at least one masturbation video, Brittany, come on, that's worth 20 bucks, you know? Right. To like, kind of equate my, the value in your mind. Right. But I, I consider that like work. So I feel obligated to make sure my clientele feels good about the money they're spending. Right. So that's how I work it in my head. If I just had like a shit ton of money, I, I don't even know that I would even charge for OnlyFans, but like, I just, if I had enough money to put in a, an account where I lived off the interest, right. 
All I'm thinking is, well, now I get to just post. Now I get to just be. Now I can just show up on stream when I get a lovely person to talk to. I don't have right. to show up on Mondays, which is my stream day. I can yes. show up Thursday night or Tuesday morning or I could – I would have flexibility in the schedule. So is that work or is that a thing I do because I want to do it All, even if I get paid or not get paid? Right. You know, even though the action might ultimately be the same, the way that you're going about it the is very different. It has yeah. to be different because, look, there's no way I could have built up an audience like I do now. There's no way I could be making the money I'm making now unless I had a business model in mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, this shit doesn't yeah. happen just because you want to be a fucking streamer. Like, you don't get money just because you want to stream. You have to have a business model in mind. Even though I'm bad at it, I do have one. <laughs> I have a business model, sort of. <laughs> it does exist. It does. <laughs> That's why you've been successful. Both I think here, so. you know, and, and that also plays into OnlyFans, too. Like, there's a lot of, like, people on the outside who are like, oh, it's so easy. Like, you just sign up for OnlyFans and make a ton of money. But you do have to approach it from a very specific business-minded perspective yeah. in order to be successful. And And, again, I'm not in the top point whatever percent i'm not making millions of dollars here but i'm making yeah. you know a, a good amount I'm, I'm happy with it yeah but it's because i was very strategic and i've tried different things i've been on that website for several years now and there are a lot of different ways you can go about it which is one reason i like this website is you can yeah. have a lot of control about what you set your subscription at um if you even have like i recently um, have changed to not having a monthly subscription mm. fee because I don't like feeling this pressure of somebody paid $20. I need to make sure in the next 30 days yeah. they're getting their, their money's worth. Right. And I, I don't like that feeling. So I recently in like the past year ish have gone to a free subscription model where then it's more like an a la carte. And so this way I yeah. can like, post when I feel inspired, when I want to post, I have a back catalog I can work through. Um, and people can, can choose what they want to see still. They're still getting access to a lot of different media and content, but I feel personally less obligated, which then in turn makes me feel more inspired. And I probably post more on this kind of a schedule than I would otherwise, because I'm not feeling like oh, I got to make sure I put up my daily OnlyFans post or whatever. You know, I recently was contemplating having a free OnlyFans because I follow certain models that way and I ended up buying a lot of their stuff and I spent more for them than I would a monthly fee. Like I end up do spending It more. adds up being more. Yeah. So a part of me was wondering if I should do that, not only to offer people like a free space to go to, but one of the ways that I brand horribly, and this is, okay, I'm going to go into business mind right now. This is the stuff that does piss me off about people because, like, look, I'm not in that um, – like, I'm not above, like, probably, like, a six in terms of the aesthetic typical looks, right? So, like, I can't just get an OnlyFans and make a, a million dollars. Like, I'm not that hot. Like, hot girls, yeah. I discovered – Genevieve, I had my mind blown. I was on the bubble of Instagram that I always hear men talk about that I never experienced, which is genuinely just hot girl. She has nothing else. I'm looking at this girl. Yeah. She's so hot. I'm like, holy fuck. Holy, I'm like so gay. I'm like, oh my God, this girl. I go, who is she? What is she thinking about life? I click on her profile. Nothing. Just hot girl. And I'm just, like. Just hotness. I, I know nothing about her. Like, I don't know anything about her family life or like what she thinks about politics or it's just her whole brand is I'm hot. And I'm like, oh, I will never be this woman. But holy fuck, I would so capitalize on this if I was her. Because like I, she doesn't have to do anything versus Britney. I have to have a philosophy, a mind. I have to prove I'm smart enough to contend with people. I have to have, like, a whole backup of, like, well, Brittany's not just an OnlyFans girl. She's also kind of smart. Like, I can't – I'm not hot enough just to have the hot look. So when people say, like, you can just go on OnlyFans and have an audience, the fuck you can't. No, oh, yeah. you can't. For, yeah, I also don't fit your stereotypical hot girl Instagram OnlyFans model look, right? Like, my, my appeal, my sexuality has to come from other – elements i have to seduce my audience i have, I have to be to... more real we have to be more real yeah. which is great we have to be more ourselves than pretty there's girls. obviously a market for that too yes. like everybody can exist simultaneously because of course we're looking for different as things they should um as i'm looking should, for hot girls too you know yes yes <laughs> <laughs> they're only fans this I'm is like, not a shame this on is the hot not girls a shame on they, no, fuck. they're killing it killing and it. i love that for them i love them. that for and them um, I love seeing it. It's fantastic. But yeah, my strategy does have to be 
more than just existing yes as yes just a physical being yeah now one of the things that i think people don't understand like one of the things i do poorly with my branding is that i have an youtube channel and an only fans and it confuses people because the youtube channel isn't about sex work as much like it doesn't oh, i don't do yeah. try-ons i don't do like so even my instagram it's more like i have like family photos and stuff on my instagram yeah and I, have, like, I started following your insta <laughs> You know, and I have like booty pictures, so it's confusing. If I chose a, a a spot, if I actually said to myself, "Okay, Brittany, we're only doing in, uh like Instagram hot girl OnlyFans focus," like to the ability, you know, whatever, I bet I could make more money on OnlyFans. I'm pretty sure, but because I confuse my audience, I don't say to my audience like this is the kind of clients I want because I have such a diversity of clients from my yeah. callers. Like, okay, Mr. Girl was doing this thing where he's like. So your sex work and your philosophy stuff is going to have a weird overlap, but it, it actually never does. Uh, most of my callers are women or men who are really having like just a desire to talk about simple things from anime and fun stuff to genuinely being like, what do you think Socrates meant when he said this? And the, all we're doing is thinking. This and is then, not a sexual exchange. This is not a sexual exchange. And 99.9999% of my callers get that. Um, I've, I rarely block people. Maybe once every six months I have a problem with somebody, men and women, who think, like, this is a way to date Britney. Yeah. Um, But, you know, the, it is what it is. Only fans-wise, my clients are amazing. They're so good with their energy. And I don't know why I got this, except that I must have just – put out this energy of saying this is what I want from my audience people who are chill sex positive respectful compassionate you know think about my boundaries think about yours you know what I mean and yeah. so I, I could be better at branding if I just stuck like if I was like you know how Steven's like a streamer and he streams every day and yes he think yes I can't do that I don't have the fucking spoons or the attention span. Uh, I feel that a hundred percent I feel mm -hmm. like I struggle because I am this multifaceted individual online right and like the people maybe who want to buy my only fans content are not the same people who want to listen to me debate abortion law totally right like totally. there's not always an overlap but sometimes there is sometimes, sometimes. there's crossover that's my favorite um, yeah yeah i think that's really cool people can like be like you know what i saw you on that um debate and now i'm going to follow you on only fans and i love that you're doing both and yeah and that's cool because you know we are multifaceted people and we should be able to do both. But I think that the reason that I've not amassed such a big online following, so to speak, is because I'm not doing just like that one thing. It's not just people really know. need consistency, even as audience members. You know, when you like if you when you're an online content creation enough, it happens where they're like, I used to watch you when you did these things, but now you've changed. Like I have callers who I always see people comments about that yes. all the fuck. Time. people want the same thing but you as a content creator do get fucking bored and you're like yeah. i don't want to be this thing so like even my callers will tell me like i have people who are just dedicated to listening to my podcast and they never watch a stream because and they I know that. that they're only interested in that one form they like of your my, content. they like that form of me like i monologue very particularly with a subject matter in mind versus my uh live shows i'm like adhd i'm like huh, what who ha 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 and i'm like on a bunch of things i like you know i i lose my sentence like halfway through i'm a mess my my podcast i'm like pretty good at like so it's like a same with only fans a lot of my callers they're like oh i don't want to buy your only fans britney because like i'm not into girls or like oh that feels weird like i do calls with you i don't want to do that so everyone has their own boundaries too some people are like no i do calls and i love your only fans i love both it doesn't matter to me. Actually, okay, major reason I absolutely knew I was going to fall in love with my partner is that he was like, yeah, I've bought your OnlyFans. I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I and love that. Thank you. That's fucking awesome. It, listen, I don't trust no man who says he wants to date me but refuses to buy my OnlyFans. I had a guy do that. I went on a date with this guy, and he's like, oh, I would never – first of all, who even pays for OnlyFans? How stupid is that? And I looked at him what? like – What red flag? Oh, my God. Huge red flag. I was like, sir – and I looked at him. I was like, you're on a date with a person who has an OnlyFans. He's like, yeah, I know, but, like, you know, I'm going to be the breadwinner. He didn't even make money. He lived with his mom. And he goes, I'm, I'm gonna, I need to be the breadwinner in this relationship. This is why I only go on one date. You just need one. Ask them the right you questions. Yeah. You only need one. Yeah, yeah. You really can get a pretty good gist of what the person's about, where your compatibility is with one date. I'm telling whether you. Whether it's good or bad. Just ask them the question. Like, 
exactly, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> but like that stuff is so interesting to me. And so again, finding someone that respected my work that didn't even think to ask me not to do it, that, you know, he has his own boundaries. He has previously been supportive of it. He is pro sex work, so it helps. And like, that's the thing is, why does, we should go on Steven's stream for his birthday and yell at him because why does Steven do this thing sometimes where he's really pro sex work? And then if he debates certain people, he's like all of a sudden it's kind of anti sex work. And I'm like, what is this consistency? Yeah, you're totally right because he and I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation way back before like Lav was ever giving her preachy stuff on on sex work, etc. Like mm -hmm. way before it blew up to this big like OnlyFans conversation that everybody wanted to have an opinion on. Um, and he and I had very little disagreement. Like it was like a super chill conversation. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. sex work is a good option for people. Absolutely. People should, you know, embrace it if that's what they choose to do. Yes, it can be way more freeing than working in a normal job. Like we had all of these mm -hmm. like eye to eye moments. And then later I'm like, huh, well, what? tell us how you really feel, Stephen. Why are we going to <laughs> cope? Like I, I, I get to this point where I'm like, I want to know why you're pro something from like a philosophy standpoint. So like legally, I'm very pro abortion because my philosophy of bodily agency has to trump every uncomfortable feeling I have about anything. And so even though spiritually, I don't think we should be like terminating our pregnancies. I think legally and maybe even in that moment, spiritually, caveat, you could need that thing. And so I don't want anyone to tell you what you need because you don't live that person's existence. And that comes from anything from sex to drugs to any way you raise your child. Even like I've been talking to a bunch of kids like because I lived in a reality where my parents were kind of like on the fence of like not abusive enough to call CPS, obviously, but like kind of abnormally strict. Now they were really immigrants. Okay. So maybe it was that, you know, because they're from Iraq. Like, yeah, cultural. Maybe it was cultural. Thing. Definitely got brought up a lot. Like, well, in Iraq, this is how we would be disciplined. So you've got it mm. easy, which is true. I did have it easy compared to my parents. Right. But compared yeah. to my friends, I was like living in Guantanamo Bay sometimes. So it was like <laughs> this whole conversation around like limitations so like I've been talking to my friends about this and we agree that like ending up in the system would have fucked us over majorly but we often pull kids out away from their like toxic homes and put them in systems but the systems aren't exactly any better and kids fare better being raised in toxic homes sort of and then leaving those toxic homes and doing it on their own than even ending up with that black trash bag that they give you and they're like peace out figure it out kid at 18 with wow. no sense of guidance because at that point you have no connection to anyone around you at at least when you stay in your toxic home, you have your neighborhood and your school and your like, so maybe there's your a place siblings, of nuance. Hopefully. Your siblings, hopefully, <laughs> maybe grandparents, maybe aunties and uncles, you know? So there's sort yeah. of like this reality in which I understand that these are really bad things happening. And at the same time, I need you to learn how people can still utilize major tools you haven't seen because you're so offended by the imagery. You're so offended by the fact that people are like spreading their ass cheek and pouring milk and cereal and then eating out of their ass that you don't understand that on the other side of cereal ass eating, okay, there is also girls and boys and non-binary people who are just simply doing this kind of photography, literally showing their back. And it's the same thing because right. it's on the same site and everyone's freaking out. You know, so I want people to find the nuance. I want people to find the ability to say, can I utilize this tool to find my joy? Even if for somebody else that could be their hell on earth, including right. religion, including OnlyFans, including God. Like if you want to become a devout Muslim and wear burqa from head to toe, I will support you if it facilitates your joy. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like I don't, yes. You know, I, Brittany, as a like pro nudist person, obviously have feelings around modesty. <laughs> but at the same time, like modesty plays a role. I feel very modest right now. I'm very covered you, up. Yeah. I'm very modest right now, right? And I love Indeed. it. It was a vibe today. It's cozy. It's nice. Yeah. You know? So I'm looking for that. Cozy vibe. I'm I'm but, hoping these conversations turn more into that than Steven and Abba talking about how it's a cope to do sex work and everyone's ugh. like coming at me and I'm like, gross. Just are we pro freedom or not? Do we want people to have agency right. or not? Fuck. Uh, that comes down to like really the main point in a nutshell to me is I don't understand how anyone can identify as feminist or pro equality mm. and then try and dictate what someone else is doing with their body and mm -hmm. their their life, right? Mm -hmm. Like from like a feminist standpoint this this idea that all sex workers are victims of the patriarchy and there's no way that you can be doing this that's positive for you et cetera, et cetera, really feels like it's in the same camp as people that don't believe women should be able to vote yeah. like you're telling me that you don't think i can make 
a responsible decision and then deal with the consequences of said decision. Totally. And that's bullshit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes those lessons we need to learn. Like, I don't know how many things I've tried. How many times I've done YouTube. Look, my whole life for the 12, 13 years I've been on YouTube or whatever it's been, people have always told me, like, you should quit. You're not making money. You're not successful yet. You have to work like two jobs, three jobs anyways so you're obviously not going to be a youtuber and even now when people are like are you one of those millionaire youtubers i was like oh i wish i wish i was a six-figure well, youtuber love to be <laughs> i would love to be thank you a girl can dream okay a girl can dream <laughs> like i'm not i'm not i don't even think i'll ever be there like to be honest but i could maybe in a different way maybe not through youtube maybe you know what i'm saying so yeah th- but that's one of the things oh, hold on wait i lost my train of thought wait youtuber success oh people told me to quit But what they were really saying is, I don't think you're utilizing this bubble in the way that's bringing you your joy. I think they were more concerned about the fact that I wasn't happy all the time. But once I figured out my joy, I became a much better YouTuber. And now they're pro the YouTube because they're like, oh, you figured it out. But I didn't figure out YouTube. I figured out my joy. Yes. Yeah. No. I think a lot of times once we figure out our joy, those other things that felt like obstacles become easier or they just kind of like fall into place a little bit more naturally right. because your your energy your in your center is able to facilitate better totally like those other projects so same with sex work it's not that I needed sex work to find my joy it was that even even when I didn't have sex work I was enjoy when I sorry when I had sex work I wasn't joyful when I was joyful, I had sex work and I was joyful. It wasn't the sex work. The sex work didn't change. I had sex work the whole time. Yeah. It was the joy. And then while I was joyful, I kept certain things and sex work survived the purge because I purged yeah. everything that wasn't bringing me joy. Sex work stayed. Again, everyone's like, Brittany just does it for the money. Girls, girls, <laughs> literally, like, I don't even go after people who leak my OnlyFans. I don't give a fuck. If you want to share my OnlyFans, I think you should do right by sex workers and pay them. I think you should do right by artists and pay them. Yeah. But like, pay I'm for, not, you know what I mean? the content you consume, yeah. ideally. <laughs> like, join my memberships on YouTube, $2, guys. Look, I'm only charging $2 because I feel a bad reasonable, charging. Reasonable, reasonable amount. I feel bad charging $5 for like emojis, basically. So I'm like, how about $2 for emojis? Because that's really what you're getting as a member, right? You're getting emojis. Oh, yeah. and then extra, oh, saucy pics because some people were complaining when I posted like more cute like lingerie photos for YouTube that were appropriate, but not, not appropriate. Yeah. People were like, hey, I wouldn't, I don't want to see this on YouTube. Like, I go to your OnlyFans to see this. And I'm like, oh, but like some people on YouTube do want to see it without paying $20. So yeah. I, I put some of those photos on the membership thing. So for $2, you can see some on occasion saucy photos, you know, that's that are still good. in TOS. Yeah, that's a good in between. Yeah. But like, the, again, when I'm thinking about my joy, and I understand like the law in society and what we're doing for bubbles can differ. But again, when I go back to my Seattle bubble and everyone's polyamorous and sex aware and you BDSM, it's very hard to imagine needing a lack of sex work in this bubble when sex work is the thing that makes us all so happy. Like, it's just, it's, right. you know what I'm saying? we're still in that society so do you mean like parts of society do you mean like san francisco versus southern california totally different like what are we talking about here you know what i mean because that does make a huge difference and huge all of the answers are different based on that because it plays out differently so since you're an activist though do you find that there's anything in particular like the abortion issue maybe where you're like this is objectively needs to be like legalized federally or do you have like an objective feeling towards it or it's still subjective, but you feel very strongly about it? I would say the there are three issues that I feel very strongly about and that I tend to support through activism. The first is abortion access. Mm-hmm. Um, I do believe um, that Roe v. Wade was written in a weak way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have a lot of legal things that we could do better to make it so that it wasn't so easy to repeal, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. The bottom line is, I don't think that where you live should dictate what medical access you have. And obviously, I shared that I went through this childhood cancer diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I was very privileged in having access to the care that I had and to the doctors that I had. And I 100% would not be alive if I did not have that access. Like that is unquestionable to me. Um, 
I have always had health insurance. That's another privilege that's super, super impactful. But I have known people and I have lost people who didn't have the access that I have. And it's mind boggling. It's one of the things that that keeps me up at night that we have these resources. We have this ability to we live in the greatest country on earth, right? <laughs> like, yeah. And at, and there are still Americans who cannot access what could be life saving health care for them. And in a yeah. lot of situations, women are seeking out abortion where maybe they have some sort of medical issue that makes it pertinent for them. Maybe it's a mental health issue. Maybe it's a lifestyle, whatever their choice is. This is something that they're, they feel is necessary. It's the right choice. Right. And where they live shouldn't dictate whether or not they can actually pursue that. In my mind, I feel mm -hmm. like that's just absurd. And I think that the only people should be involved in any kind of decision like that is the individual and the physician or the, mm -hmm. the medical provider, right? Like mm -hmm. doctors uh, operate under a code of ethics. So if they're doing a procedure, it has to be, you know, in line with those things. And I think that they should be the ones that are saying when or, you know, it ha all of those things. Like those, yeah. those are the people who should be making those decisions. So from my perspective, that's something I'm really passionate about. And I always have been. And um, I find myself being very active in that. Um, another arena is decriminalization of sex work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not pro legalization, but I'm definitely pro decriminalization and mm -hmm. so spreading information about the differences between totally. the two and why most sex workers themselves would prefer decriminalization, yeah. I think is super important. Um, and the third area is federal legalization of marijuana. Like, what the fuck are we doing? Let's like, why? go! <laughs> Come to <laughs> Biden! American in jail for that. Like it's it literally fucking stupid and so blows stupid. my mind we're here and that's still a reality. So, so those dumb. three subjects I'm very passionate about. You know what's funny is like I have I, I mean I agree with all the I want all those things too. But like the thing is is that I, I always <laughs> like the method in which we do it or how it sounds. Like I this is where I always end up being like cock blocked by my own brain. Cause I'm people are like, Well, you know how San Francisco is gay? Why can't Texas be conservative? I was like, Great, do that. But then I'm like, but then you have to, like, just recognize that people will migrate and move in and out and you're going to give birth to kids that have, like, certain belief systems. So as long as those kids have access to, like, you know what? I, like, how do you? Yeah. Like, yeah. You like, know, it's kind of awkward. Now we're having this conversation about, like, and why Texas? Like, I can smoke in my weed, but the moment I go next door or wherever to Texas, wherever Texas is, like, you go to Texas and all of a sudden it's 10 years. Like, if you get caught, yeah. it's like, bros. How is this America? And then, it, but then I understand like states' rights, and then people feel like, well, why do I have to live like you? What if I want to be Amish? And I'm like, okay, I guess. And so now we're all just like clashing. And so a, a part yeah. of me, like a part of me, likes that certain neighborhoods have certain vibes, and if you like this vibe, move there. But then I worry about the law, and like, what if you just cross a border and you don't even realize you've crossed? Right. It? Have you ever gone into Texas at different states? Like I've gone all over the U.S. multiple times, but like when you enter Texas for certain places, <laughs> it goes, "You're entering Texas. Do not have weed on you. You're entering Texas. Do not have weed on you. Ten years. Ten years. Ten years." And I'm yes. like, they're trying to warn you, but at the same time, you're in your head. You're thinking it's a fucking look at my gummy. Look at my fucking weed. Yeah, this is an edible. Like how who how are they gonna know? And you're thinking in your stupid head, oh, I'll put it with my Jolly Ranchers. No one will know. And no, yeah, it's fine. But then if you get caught and you have a certain amount on you, and you go to open prison it for or this test it or whatever, yeah, this. <sighs> like what? Third, Miss when I travel to other states, I'm constantly like aware of that. You know, if yes. I'm driving, I'm like, okay, I all. <laughs> I travel with weed all the time. Totally. It's kind of, I smoke weed every day. And ladies yep. and gentlemen, that's, that's the Me routine. Me too, girl. Me too. Uh, <laughs> both medicinally and because it's fucking awesome. Amen. Um, <laughs> so I'll find myself like, oh, I'm coming up on the Texas border or until recently the Arizona border mm. or like all of these states um, where you can't have weed or you couldn't until they recently made it yeah. um, acceptable, you know? But you'd have I I would find myself like okay let me pull over at the rest stop and like make sure there's no weed in the main cabin of my car I'm gonna carefully put it hidden yes. in my suitcase in my trunk behind the other suit like yes ridiculous and then it's like 
okay, because I drove past this fucking line on the state, on, you know, the map or whatever. But before I do all of that, I'm going to smoke a joint back on the California state line or wherever I am. And so, like, I'm, I don't know. It's just, it's ridiculous to me. I'm waiting. Um, Why aren't Democrats fucking working ever? If Democrats just gave me, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, but man, if they gave me weed, I'd be like, Democrat for life, bitch. I'm like, this is impacting so many families' lives. Over, I like, don't a, know how we're still waiting for how this. How are we still waiting? Like, I don't even fucking get it. But then at the same time, that's the problem. I run into then, then I hear the bubble in my ear going, what about states' rights? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. Uh, and then I, I don't know what that means. And then, like, that sounds like a dog was sometimes so I'm like I also don't know what that means and then I start yeah so then my work has to center around the individual because I don't know how these systems are supposed to solve their problems when again you watch did you watch do you follow the Britney Griner stuff in Russia mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. like I'm a very emotional person when it comes to Britney I'm very connected to like gay news in particular but also like my dad calls me and he's like Betsy I know you're going to Europe soon do not take weed I don't want you to be like Britney Griner and my dad is religious he always stays like I don't know why he does this well he does it for me but like he says he's in tune with, like, gay weed stories. Not that he's pro-gay. Okay. He really okay. isn't. And he's not even, like, happy I'm doing weed. But I think he's really just looking out for me, right? He's trying to say, what if my daughter was Britney? Well, well I am a yeah. Britney. Like, you know well. what I mean? <laughs> this is Britney. And he feels like, like he's so worried. Other people are like, fuck her. That was the law. That's what she gets. Fuck her. And I'm like, okay, again, you can have this attitude. But I really appreciate my dad who can at least think, well, what if that's my daughter? He can say, right. what if that's my Britney? You know what I mean? And that makes you so much more compassionate, so much more thoughtful. You know, compassion by definition means to suffer with. So when people say, I have compassion, and then they say, fuck Britney Griner, she went to Russia with weed. You're not suffering with Britney in that moment, dude. Right. Absolutely not. You have no compassion like, in that moment. So that's fine, but own it. Right. Don't claim to be if you're you're truly not. Exactly. And then same thing. Like, look, sometimes we do have compassion, but we forget to consider people we've never thought to consider before. And I think that's another part of it is like consideration means to be thoughtful of the future that could occur based off present action. So, again, it's like you have to be a little skilled in thinking of the future, which I don't think. I think a lot of people are so stuck in their past that they're not even thinking of their future. So they're not thinking mm-hmm. of your future. They can't think of their neighbor's future when they can barely think of their own future. Exactly. So the layer here is way too like complicated for people to simply say or think, well, I'm such a good person. Look how compassionate I am. While still tweeting out, fuck Brittany Griner. It's like, bro. Like how, you know what I mean? But that's the world we live in. So how do you every day wake up and not want to kill yourself? yeah yeah i get that because the world that we live in is infuriating and it feels you know as i mentioned earlier part of my philosophy feels like well none of it fucking matters like we're all just here by coincidence and chance and some crazy chemical reaction yeah you know it, it doesn't fucking matter and and i mean It doesn't. It doesn't fucking matter, really, at the end of the day. Like, we're going to, we're all going to die and there's going to be more people that are born. Like, it's totally a cycle, right? Like, we're a very small part in it. Um, But the reason that I actively want to wake up every day and not kill myself is because of things like compassion and love and, and that human connection really it makes all of the other bullshit and frustration worth it to me yeah I agree no I agree I feel the same too I always say that I'm like nothing matters so I'm fine but like oh my god it matters on the micro like what I'm experiencing can matter my feelings can matter but we're all gonna die and I wish people would internalize that someone said and I'm gonna have a conversation with them in January something like Britney says the most basic shit and thinks like nobody knows it but I don't believe anyone knows that I don't think anyone on the mass scale knows we're all gonna die like they if they did then why the fuck do you give a fuck about a gummy right why are you living your life the way that you're living it if you know that you could be dead tomorrow like like literally the that, difference, like even when it comes to like even nudity. So like, this is fine. I take off my top and everyone's like, <gasps> and I'm like, okay, I get it in certain circumstances for sure. But also like, if we're all going to die and these tits are going to be worm food, what is the, what is the power they hold? What are we giving them? Hey. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't. So I have to always remember, like, I'm going to die. I'm probably going to die. Who knows? I have like an autoimmune issue. Maybe like I get sick with COVID and it hits me just perfectly and I die. 
right? I don't know that I'm going to live very long, but I hope that I do. And I'm going to make that effort to like feed this body and keep it going. But realistically, every time I get up in the morning and I do not spend much time on Twitter and I see someone just like tweeting about how ugly Trump is or tweeting about this, I was like, I have those petty thoughts too, but you're writing them on Twitter like you think you're saving someone's life. And I want to yeah, know how like that it's works. making a difference somehow. Like it's making a difference. And I'm like, that's interesting to me. Versus like, well, I understand why people fight for like, hey, I want abortion accessibility because that gives people more choice. When I hear more choice, I'm on board. If it gives us more freedom, I'm on board. That's my rule of thumb, right? But yeah. yet the same people that are so pro, why didn't, how did Republicans co-op the freedom narrative? <laughs> that's a point that I brought up in in a lot of the debates that I would have with more conservative creators when I was discussing abortion is you're literally coming from this party of of freedom, right? Of like, I'm not going to let the government tell me what to do. Right. And yet you're literally wanting the government to limit my freedom. So make that make sense. Like make it make sense. And I get, that's what I mean. I don't think people believe what they say they believe or rather they don't know why they believe what they say they believe. And so yes. it, it drives me a little loopy, to be honest, because I understand it. I I'm just trying to live my best life, but I have to live it based off of how other people are going to decide to treat me today or how they're going to treat it themselves. And I'm saying you just do the Britney method, which is like live and let live, but also be cautious and have boundaries and be open and say, like, I don't want the worst to happen to laugh, you know, but I still don't need to interact mm -hmm. with her. It's not the end of the world. She doesn't need me in her life. What the fuck? I'm just a, who am I to her anyways? She doesn't need me. Right. I'm not abandoning somebody that was she close to me. She can exist in a completely different realm literally or, you know. and we never have to interact <laughs> but that's the thing is that people will do the well if you really cared about mental health you would help everyone who's sick and i was like oh if only <sighs> right if only <laughs> i don't see that happening boo boo like i just don't see it yeah, happening that's let's be realistic here you know we can only do we can only do so much like we are we are only human so we are. i think for me i get so much more gratification and it feels much more productive to work with a niche community or like one-on-one -on -one yeah. because I know I can't help everyone. I know I can't educate everyone. I know I can't entertain everyone. Like it's just, that's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I want to ask how your spoons are doing in general. But as I have, far as our conversation. Yeah. Like how do you feel? And like time and everything. And time and everything. I feel good. Yeah. We're what about two hours in. Okay. I know mentioned that you have something later this afternoon yeah let me uh, message it's my it's my nutritionist dietitian everybody knows about her she's amazing that's let me, fantastic she yes i love that for you yeah she, oh you want to talk about accessibility to um she is a very expensive nutritionist dietitian but honestly in conjunction with my doctors i probably spend near two thousand dollars a month between the two of them um and i do it out of pocket because it ends up being cheaper than having insurance in this fucking country at least Ugh. in the state i'm in and so yes. i'm looking at it like i'm just like sitting there like always doing math of like what is more reasonable but if i ever have kidney failure because of my lupus get ready kids Brittany's gonna be bankrupt <laughs> that's when we might see a gofundme of some sort <laughs> bro it's like uh, i wish insurance. i wish i was making like even if I was, ma I'm, not, I'm making like $2,000 a month on OnlyFans right now, like on average. Like sometimes it goes up to like five if I'm on a good month, but usually it's about two, 2K. And I'm really yeah, transparent yeah. with my money because I don't care. But like it's one of those things where like 2K and like I have to pay tax on that. So then 2K then tax. Mm -hmm. And then I get that money and that pays like my rent. And that's great and that's awesome and that's like totally worth it. But realistically, like it doesn't even cover health insurance or AAA or any of my other bills. And so, of course, right. I have to work multiple jobs. It's a piece of the puzzle. And it's that's how piece. it is for me, too. Like, I'm glad that it's helping to contribute to the bigger fund, right? But it's yes. definitely not covering all of my bills. That's for sure. I wish it was. I'm, I'm in the same boat, like around 2K. And honestly, like my friends and I are very transparent with it as well. Those who have huge followings, obviously, they're making six figures or or yeah, more, which is right? amazing. Like, Congratulations, fantastic! Like, that's amazing. I love it for them. I'm so yeah. proud of them, and they work fucking hard. It's not like they're, you know, taking days off and, and no. not approaching it from a business standpoint. Like they are out there every single day doing it. Um, but most most of us on OnlyFans who are like consistently doing it, I would say, are probably making like one to three thousand a month yeah I think, I think so is like a pretty realistic outcome for someone yeah. and I like again it's like 
when I think of OnlyFans, I just think about like working two jobs or three jobs because it can't be the sole. Like two thousand dollars is enough for maybe um I don't know. I've like I want to have kids and I so I have this like particular standard of wanting to avoid some of the things that I experience as a kid, but also I don't have to be like the eighties anymore where we just like get pregnant and like ooh, like I can plan out my sure, pregnancies. Yeah. <laughs> I like I'm currently on birth control so I don't get pregnant. Like I I feel like responsibility means adjusting to what the world can offer us with the technology boom we've had, with the accessibility to medical care, with the like I know better now. So I don't have to live off 2K. I can live off 5 or 10K. But I can only yeah. get there if I work my two to three jobs. If I pay attention to how I'm spending my spoons. If I pay attention to my mental health. Are you lighting up a joint or a cigarette right now? A joint. I yeah, fucking that... hate you. I want it Ugh. so bad. I haven't smoked since May because with lupus, you have a, like a 50% higher chance of a blood clot <sighs> and heart attacks oh. if you smoke. So I haven't hit a bong since May. And it's been, Dang. It's the oh, worst. man. It's the uh. worst. Okay, my Jeez, I feel for you. I would struggle if I had to give that up. I'm lucky that none of my medical needs require that of me. Bro, literally, that's why I'm an edible whore. But you know what? I even have to have a weed budget because I can't afford. My doctor asked me, he's like, or she's like, sorry. She's like, can you up your um your like uh weed intake? I was like, well, I one, I can't during my day because I'm like working. I need right. um, unless the caller specifically requests weed, Brittany. Sure, yeah. And I plan my Exception. day around being high. But yeah. in general, I do it usually towards the end of my day, like around three, four o'clock, my body just starts to like ache. And like that's it's kind of starting right now around my wrist, which is pretty common. So I ignore those. But we yeah, would, but it'll expand. It will expand and go th throughout the whole thing. But like, OK, so I put myself on a weed budget because if I really had as much weed as I needed every night, I'd have to like I'm on a, like one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars a month right now. I'd probably need about three if I'm being honest, but for pain, you know, management and stuff. But not yeah. worth it. It's not worth it. I'd rather just be in pain for a while. And like the over the counter pain meds kind of help, kind of don't. And so it's kind of like one of those things where which pills am I popping is basically the question I have to ask myself. That's really something that I tackled too. So I was during my treatments that went on for years because I had this obscure random yeah. uh, type of cancer. Um, I was on fentanyl patches. Like everybody talks oh, about fentanyl really? being, you know, fucking crazy. I literally lived on them for like the better part of a year. I fucking drove. Like I Whoa. went to school. I lived my life <laughs> on fentanyl. Um, Percocet, Norco, Vicodin, Oxy, Xanax, Valium, Ambien, like just the pharmaceuticals that I had and that were given to me, like, even when I was, like, 16 years old, like, mm. was Whoa. just wild. You're right. Whoa, so yeah, you were a kid. What the fuck? I was a kid. Whoa. Like, absolutely wild. And it wasn't everybody's like, oh, your doctor shouldn't have been doing that. No, like, I was crying in their office in pain. Like, they they were doing what – they were treating the symptoms that needed to be treated. Absolutely. Um, but – now that I'm not in like active treatment, I'm able to to kind of be a little more mild with the medication. I obviously am not at a pain level where I need fentanyl daily. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. Um, but I am at a point still where my doctors would, if if needed, prescribe some sort of narcotic painkiller. The reason that I smoke choose to smoke weed medicinally is that even though it is more expensive and I have to pay out of pocket for it versus my five dollar yes. copay for like a bottle of Norco or something is it, it, it affects me better. It makes me more functional. I'm, I'm able to lead a healthier existence yeah. this way. So, um, yeah, it is I, more expensive. I'm envious of your weed budget because mine is way more than that. And obviously where we live makes a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. Too. So like obviously local taxes and stuff play a factor. Yes. Moving from California. Nevada was actually really good because the California tax on weed is crazy. I swear they are purposely trying to fuck over weed farmers. Like, what are they insane? Like, I saw Newsom, who I've, I've met once. I had Newsom. Um, My so friend used to cut his hair in San Francisco. Do they hate him or love Like him? a decade ago. A decade um, ago. Like, okay. Same. Actually, <laughs> that's when I met him about a decade ago um, at okay. a pride parade. But yeah, like, there, there's this thing where, like, some people are suggesting, like, a 99% tax or a 90% tax. on, And I'm like, bros, come on. Get your shit together. That is fucking absurd. Get your like, shit together. Like, uh, excuse me. And like, I get it. Like, my parents told me once you moved out of California, they're like, you're never going to be able to come back. It's kind of true. Like, I now that I'm looking at housing prices in Cali, I'm like, how did I ever live here? This, how did yeah. I ever live here? 
what I, right now in Vegas, I have three bedrooms, two baths with a garage in the part of town that I want to be in with a view, like fantastic. The amount of rent that I pay right now wouldn't even get me a studio in San Francisco. Yeah. Like it's crazy. I lived in the tiniest, like 350 square foot studio for years in, it was great location, you know, right where all the action is in the heart of the city. But like, God damn, it's hard. And when I think about like moving back, I don't want to downsize. Like I love my space way too much. Totally. And I, and I probably couldn't. The reason I was able to live in a studio at that point in my life is because I was working 60 hours a week outside of my home. Exactly. So, exactly. No, exactly. Okay. So I will say this too, to all the hustlers out there, I commend you because like I literally, I am one of those people that now, cause I used to do that all the time. Now I do choose my mental health and physical health, but that means I don't work as much. Like everyone always says, Oh, you charge two fifty for your calls. You must be making so much money. Um, my spoons dictate how much money I get to make. You're not ta- taking endless calls either. No, I t- like, I don't, I, I don't, I take as many as I can take for the month. So I always keep it open until the, about the 15th ish. Then I close it. Or if I have days open, I say, Hey guys, I can manually add people in. Hey, I have enough spoons today. Anybody want to do a call in the next like two hours? Like I sure. can, move, but I don't, I can't actually like, you know, how people have like Google calendars or some cal- calendar where they're like, say you're free from eight to eight and just have the spots open and people can pick them. I can't do that mm-hmm. because I can't risk. What if one day they want to book a call with me, but I'm having a really bad gut health day or I'm having a really bad like chronic pain day and I can't, yeah. I can't function. Right. right Instead of canceling right. on callers, I just don't take as many calls. And then I lose out because on- it's easier to add them in if you're feeling good too. Like exactly. right, it's easier to add more than it is to take it away. Exactly, exactly. I, you know, it's funny. I would have been able to work myself to the bone in my twenties, but since the lupus diagnosis, like, I genuinely, if I just go over too much, I'll even tell my dietitian this, and she'll be like, "Yeah, Brittany, like if you even walk the dog for too many days in a row, it's gonna fuck you up." And I was like, "How?" How? How the thing that I do all that my seems, life? Yeah, that oh. seems like a very healthy habit, but. <laughs> literally mrs get Brittany out of the house because she never leaves and i finally do it for a week because i'm dog sitting my brother's dog and it wrecked me I, w- I felt like i was dying again i thought i was literally like gonna have to go to the hospital and i was like what is this and i'm like okay so it's like fine it's fine the game changes every decade we get new bodies and new skin and new whatever and we have to like change our whole thing up again and new attitudes like i'm dying to me 40s Brittany. i think she's really gonna be great i feel that same way about 40s genevieve because 30s genevieve is way cooler than 20s genevieve had any idea exactly Exactly. And 20s Genevieve was pretty cool. Like, she was. Dude, 20s Brittany was so open, so adventurous, so willing, so much energy. I don't even know where it went, but I don't have it now. But I think 40s Brittany is going to have something different. I think she's going to – yeah, I don't know. But I'm I'm happy for her already. I don't even know what she's doing yet. But I think it's going to be great. It's going to be cool, whatever it is. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Listen, th- so far, like, this has been definitely one of my favorite conversations I've had with somebody. Um, What's it been like for you? This has absolutely been one of my favorite conversations that I've had with somebody. I love it. Like, I feel like we're sitting in the same room, even though we're not. We're, yeah. like, you know, some virtual distance away or whatever. Um, And it's been really awesome. Like, I really liked it. I came into this just totally on the did and just like okay well we're gonna see where it goes we're just gonna chat and, you know and I, I, love I knew we'd have plenty in common and we didn't even go over all the things we really have in common either like, i know we really talked there's about like BDSM. there's so much more <laughs> so i want to have this conversation again but also i want to preemptively ask you and you do not have to say yes to this but i'm putting together a sex panel of my own for the okay. new year because okay. I have a real life sex friends and like sex worker friends that I've met even through my callers. And I'm like, we need people who aren't just chronically online to talk about this, please. Yes. Because please. like, oh my gosh, they're not the same fucking world. It's not representative of the the real community and the real culture. Yes. Yes. So if you want to be added to the DM list, yes, maybe. Heck yes. Heck yes. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yes. Oh, I'm so Those excited. Those are the kind of panels and talks that I want to participate in and that I enjoy. And I feel like I can add value in too, right? Yes. Like- <laughs> yes. I just think, especially if you do um, like full service sex work or real life sex work, you just get to experience it in such a different way. And I feel like, look, good or bad, it doesn't matter. Every job, I, I, everyone I know completes my my teacher friends complain, my doctor mm-hmm. friends complain, my janitor friends complain. I could all complain. I complain about this job. Like, I'll come up with five reasons right now. Stalking, uh, uh, boundary issues, like all this stuff, right? But we still get up and go to our jobs because some part of us knows why we're there. 
Yes. And I really want to start talking to more people about why we know we're supposed to be where we are. And sex work is a part of that. Absolutely. And I think that it's important. I like that you pointed out earlier towards the beginning of the conversation, like in talking and having these conversations that you and I are having and that we want to continue the dialogue of, we're kind of temporarily removing the survival sex worker from this conversation, not because we want to pretend they don't exist or deny their struggles or any of that. No, a hundred percent. No, like those financially, those are the charities that I support are going to people who are helping survival sex workers. Like if you're in Los Angeles, check out Queens of the Underworld. Romaina, where are you? Fantastic woman. She is on skid row, like literally giving out yes. safe sex supplies, providing education, um, that is helping so people hard. with counselors. Like, oh my God, she Oof. is a literal angel. Um, and so clearly that's a conversation that does need to happen, but they're not, the Venn diagram only overlaps so much, right? Like they're, yeah. they're ultimately very different. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish that. And a lot of the panels and conversations that have been happening on political Twitch and YouTube and whatnot. So, so far and so forth, I'm trying to have these conversations. And then, um, you know, someone will be like, but what about trans street level prostitutes who are jumping in and out of cars every day? And I'm like, I feel for them. Like I want them to have better choices. I want them to have access to these better things. But right now I'm talking about the fact that me and the other women in my community are choosing this. Yeah. This is our this is our career. We feel like this is our calling. This right. is something that we, you know, we have other options and yet this is our choice. Well, I feel like it's with anything in politics, and I hate to say this, but you want to talk about optics. You have to show that people are actually enjoying the thing you want to get legalized or protected. Otherwise, people are never going to fucking care because they're always going to say it's destructive. It's like why why with drugs? People are like, I use it medicinally. My grandma uses it. This politician uses it. We have to sell it optically to the audience or to the viewership, votership, to say that, look, we like this, so you have to give it to us to some extent, and then we can secretly trickle, not trickle down, this is not how it works, but, you know, help the communities yes. also need to be elevated but at the end of the day no one's going to humanize sex workers if they think they're doing it to themselves if they think it's only destructive if they think it's always about pimps if they think it's think 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 mm-hmm. you have to like i hate to say it but even in politics like when gay marriage was happening we pushed forward the family gay to the front lines of the office yep because it looked better than the full yep. and like It was, it was easier to digest. It was like, easier to digest. Another thing that I've been accused of by different critiques of me online is that, you know, I'm glamorizing sex work and I'm advocating for it from such a position of privilege. And I'm no way denying right. my privilege. Like, I am a white woman. I grew up in a privileged environment. I'm right. college educated. I have all of these other career options that I could be doing. I 100% know I'm from a place of privilege. That's why I'm on the internet talking about it. I don't have to fucking be doing this. Like I could just be living my real life with, you know, that aspect of it not ever being broadcast. But because I come from a place of privilege, because I know it's easier for people to look at someone like me and, oh, Genevieve does sex work? Like, yeah. I suddenly feel differently about that now because she's not what I expected. True. Another reason I talk about like smoking weed every day, like people don't always think that that's something that I could do. Like, and and I'll be a hundred percent honest. Like I smoked weed every day while I worked at Disney and Mm -hmm. all of these other major massive fortune 500 companies in an upper senior management role. Like I was a, to- I've been yeah. a functional owner for my entire adult life. Like, and I want to challenge people's assumptions of what those things look like. Exactly. And then still be open to the fact that every, well, that's why I like the word bubbles. Cause I'm like, I know there's like, yes. like, it's just like everyone is in a different, so like different weed bubbles exist. I was at the dispensary the other day and they're like, oh, you hear about X and X so-and-so like event. I was like, no, what event is this? So like, you're a stoner and you don't know what this event is. And I was like, <laughs> Bad stoner. I'm, I didn't really go up in stoner bubbles. Is there a stoner like memo that goes out that I'm not getting? It's like the gay mafia. <laughs> There's like a stoner mafia, but like yeah, like I know those stoners. Like I have stoner friends that know every strain. No, yeah. And I, I started smoking at like 28, 
Okay, I was like late, a late, yeah, late, late yeah. bloomer because I had conspir like I had conservative ideas about how like it was like awful and it was gonna blah 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 blah. And right, then I finally harmful. I yeah. smoked it and I was like, this is why people go to jail. This is why right. people go to prison. <laughs> this and i was just like man we're pussies like we're pussies oh. if we're putting people in jail for weed like there's something really pussy about it where i'm like this is, such really a- is. like who's afraid of a stoner who feels like they need to be locked up for their safety and ours literally the only I'm- thing you need to lock up is maybe like the fucking snacks because <laughs> really if I'm there's a hazard everything. for me it's late night I love sitting on my counter at like literally midnight and just like eating crackers or having some yogurt. And I'm like, what's up? Life's good. Life's good. Living my best life right now. Living my best (laughs) life right now. Oh my God. This has been a great conversation and I do want to keep talking to you, but I got to like recharge from my conversation with my dietitian. I 100% understand. And Um, this has been so great. Time has flown by. So we'll definitely make this happen again. If you, soon if you ever see me on stream and you're on and you just want to like hop on and talk about something if you see me talking about sex work and you're like oh i want to hop on like do that girl awesome okay, okay. i appreciate that like, hit yes. me up. i'm gonna start doing this thing too where i want to do the thing steven does where his discord has like a chat room thing oh, i'm a boomer yeah, yeah, so i don't yeah. know what any of that means but i, I want to start doing that that's so a cool feature yes, yeah so my friends cool. can just hop on and they can feel comfortable coming on because and i want to start taking discord calls and stuff so people know, like, this is a participatory community-based channel, yes, even though I'm the cult leader of it. But at the same time, I want this conversation to further, and I just know there's so much more we still have to talk about. Absolutely. I 100% agree, and I can't wait, and I'm so glad we finally got to make this happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank so you. I'm so I glad. Please do. And we'll talk soon. Have a great day. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Yes, you as well. Thank okay, you. Okay, bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Love you. Love you. Bye. Oh, sweet. Stuck in my head, in real life I'm in bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Then.